السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أرسله الله بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة أحمد الله واستعينه واستغفره وأعوذ بالله من شر نفسي وصلى الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يوفقني إلى سواء السبيل وإلى الصواب والسداد في قولي الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الله سبحانه وتعالى sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam according to the Prophet's own word بين يدي الساعة in the presence of the last moment and sa'a in the Arabic language uh, means different things generally the idea of a 60 uh, minute hour is is a modern uh, reasonably modern concept it's actually not a traditional understanding of a sa'a uh, the Arabs use sa'a to mean a moment or a short period of time they say qama min sa'atihi means he got up immediately so the sa'a is actually the moment of the death of the cosmos. And according to the Qur'an, uh, there's la rayba fiha. There's no doubt in the sa'a itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that the last moment will occur. And He's warned us. And He sent a messenger before the last hour. Now there are those who say the Prophet came 1400 years ago. And yet the sa'a has not come. And he said, I was sent between the two hands of the hour. Now I would say that I think it's fascinating that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the dominant belief, and it was certainly reiterated several times in tafsirs and in different uh, books of the Muslims, that the hour, the, the, uh, the, the life of the world had only been about 7,000 years. Now, if you look at that in relation to the uh, coming of the Prophet ﷺ being immediately before the hour, then we would think that 1400 years is not uh, certainly a very short time in relation to an earth that Bani Adam had only been on it about 7,000 years. Well, what, now we know quite clearly that uh, human beings have inhabited this planet for uh, millennia. We really don't know how long, but there is... Uh, obvious evidence that it was much longer than people previously had understood. And uh, it's interesting that a 13th century uh, Andalusian scholar uh, mentioned once that uh, he had a dream in which uh, he saw somebody who, uh, he asked him his name and he said, Adam, and the man said, uh, are you Abuna Adam? And he said, no, I'm not that Adam. Between that Adam and myself, were uh, 40,000 years. Now, this uh, scholar said that he considered it a true uh, vision, ru'ya, and because of that he said we should really reject uh, the, the Israeli tradition that the uh, Bani Adam had only been there 7,000 years because there was no evidence from the hadith to indicate that. The evidence would indicate that human beings have been here for a much longer period of time. So, Having said that, one of the interesting things that I find in our present time is the, the lack of concern of many Muslims with the uh, last hour, with the actual signs of the end of time. Now, I find it fascinating that this has been a major concern of ulama for over a thousand years. And it was a concern of the sahaba. There were sahaba that were so worried that the Dajjal would appear during their own lifetime. One of them said, I used to ask the Prophet ﷺ so much about the Dajjal, out of fear that I would be taken into his uh, sedition, into his fitna, into his seduction, because fitna is also means seduction, that finally the Prophet ﷺ said, don't worry, you won't see him. 
and he just gave him ease. And the Prophet in a hadith said, if he shows up and I'm amongst you, that I will defeat him by argumentation. In other words, I will defeat him with clear proofs. Because he will fool people through this false doctrine, this false teaching, in which he gets many people to follow him. Now, it's also interesting that we literally end our prayer by saying, and uh, certainly I know in the, uh, the uh, school of Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, the last thing that the person says before they ta- say taslima, which is the khuruj min as salah leaving the prayers, وَأَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ فِتْنَةِ مَسِيحَ الدَّجَّالِ that is literally how an individual leaves his prayer. That is the last word before he says, Assalamu alaikum, and I seek refuge from the fitna of the false or the imposter Messiah. Now, I would just like to use an example of the importance of these signs. The most famous tradition, which is a summation of the deen of Islam, is the tradition that's related in uh, several collections, and it's a sahih hadith, and it's in Imam uh, An-Nawawi's Arba'een. In fact, it's the second hadith that Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu relates, in which he says, "Kunna jirusan inda Rasulillahi that yawman." We were sitting with the Messenger of Allah on that specific day, and then he said, "A man appeared, ithtala'anina rajulun." A man appeared, and he mentions that he had dark black hair and he had a clear white. Uh, robe, and there was no evidence of traveling, which is a very interesting point, because it would be clear in that time, Medina was an extremely small city, and to get to that city, you would have to traverse a desert, and by traversing the desert, you would become disheveled. This is the nature of traveling in the desert, and anybody who's traveled, especially uh, on camel or even walking in the desert, and, and I've done both of them, you get extremely dirty, and you're called Ash'ath Aghbar. You're covered and disheveled. And yet this man showed no signs of journeying, and this was a, something that the Sahaba found very strange. And, but they didn't question, and he came up to the Prophet ﷺ, and he put his two knees to his two knees, and then he put his hands. There's two different opinions, either on his thighs, or on the thighs of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, from Balagh, it would be on the sides of the Prophet. Uh, some say that it was on the sides, his own thighs. But the point is, he sat extremely close to the Prophet, and then he asked him about Islam, which was the first thing. And the Prophet ﷺ informed him, and he said, Sadaqta, and the Sahaba said, Ajibna lahu. We were amazed. Here's a man who has the audacity to ask the Prophet a question, and then he tells him that he was correct in his answer. So they were shocked by this uh, statement. And then he asked him about uh, Iman, and the Prophet gave the six uh, articles of faith uh, and the five pillars of Islam, six articles of faith, and then he asked him about Ihsan. Now, most Muslims, if you ask them what is the summation of the deen of Islam, they would tend to say Iman, uh, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, and they take it from that hadith. But there's another portion of that hadith. And then he said, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنَ السَّعَى Tell me about the Sa'a. Now that is extremely important because generally although the sa'a and the sciences of the last hour are what's called in aqidah al-ghaybiyat or a sam'iyat and they're usually studied under the section which would be categorized under the rubric of iman. But despite that in this hadith we see that he asked specifically about the signs of the last hour. And the Prophet gave an extraordinary answer. He said, ma al-mas'ulu anha the one being questioned about it doesn't know any more than the one asking the question. And then he said, so tell me about the signs. Tell me about the alamat. Tell me what is going to happen. And then the Prophet ﷺ gives an extraordinary explanation. He said, You will see the servant, the maid servant, give birth to her mistress. And in a riwayah, uh, that she taridu rabbaha, her master. The, the stronger one is her mistress. Now, there are one thing that has to be understood when we look at the hadith. Is the Prophet ﷺ said, Utitu jawami al I was given the comprehensive words. In other words, he will say a very short statement. 
Alaihi Wasallam, like Adinu Nasiha, and with that one simple statement made up of two words only, books can be written. Entire books can be written because of the gradations and variations of meaning. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke, although he spoke in clear Arabic tongue, which could be understood at many levels. And this is why the simplest of the Sahaba understood clearly what the Prophet was saying, and the most sophisticated of the Sahaba understood clearly what the Prophet was saying, and their understandings were not the same. The understanding of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu is not the understanding of the other Sahaba. And that's confirmed in more than one hadith. So there were different understandings. It does not negate the fact that one person understood one thing and another person understood another thing does not in any way negate that one is right and the other is wrong. The Prophet sallallahu by the nature and the depth of his words, there are multiple meanings. And this is why in the famous hadith about Surat al-Asr of Bani Quraidah, which is related in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, لا يصلينا أحدكم إلا عند Bani Quraidah. It was understood two ways by the Sahaba, and both of them were accepted by the Prophet wasallam. And this is the nature of prophetic revelation. This is the nature of prophetic tradition. There are many, many ways of understanding the same thing, but they must be within the rightly guided boundaries of the people who know. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَسَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people who know if you don't know. The people of dhikr, the people of tadabbur, the people of tafakkur. So, having said that, I just want to make it clear that what we want to do, all of us, is to reflect deeply. Not to be people uh, that uh, simplistically take things without reflecting on them. They take them at face value. You want to be people of ul al-albab. The Muslim is, should be somebody of lub. And somebody of lub is you go past the qishra. You go past the outward shell, which is important. And we should not belittle in any way the outward uh, meanings of Islam. We're not bataniya. We're not people of, of bataniya like esotericists who turn Islam into some kind of esoteric tradition. But in this hadith he said that you will see the maidservant give birth to her mistress. Now if you look at the most outward meaning, it's been interpreted different ways. And it was interpreted by Izz ibn Abdul Salam and others as meaning that there would be great social confusion. In other words, the natural order would be turned upside down. Because in the natural order of things, you would find that the emma, who is the servant, will obey the mistress and do what the mistress tells her. This is the natural order of things. And that is the first and primary meaning. So when the mistress now is being commanded by the servant, it means things have been turned upside down. And this is a sign that the social order goes into chaos. Now one of the interesting signs of this hadith is that the, the, uh, the ulama traditionally said that children would become rebellious against their parents, which is a sign of the end of time. The Prophet ﷺ said that the children would command their parents, that respect, no reverence towards their parents. And this is an extremely dangerous sign. And you will see this now. That, and also the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يرث الولد وادده. The child will not inherit the father. And one of the meanings of that, wallahu ta'ala a'lam, is the inheritance of the anbiya. Because the inheritance of the anbiya is knowledge. And what happens is that the children will not take the knowledge. And this is why you see, particularly in this age, many of the greatest ulama whose children ha didn't take any of their knowledge. And they literally have no knowledge of their fathers who were scholars. And they are ignorant. And the fathers are in a state of uh, despair about it. How could that be? Now traditionally, most of the children of scholars were also scholars, though not always. Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, his son Yahya, was not a scholar. And he, he didn't have the qabiliyah, he didn't have the ability. Whereas his daughter Fatima was a great scholar who used to correct 
uh, the people from behind a door who were reciting the muwatta to Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, and if Imam Malik would, uh, would doze or take khadaqa or something, she would uh, remind him if they made a mistake. And she was a rawiyah of the muwatta of Imam Malik. And when he used to see his son Yahya, he used to say to his group, his companions, Subhanallah, Subhanalladhi lam yaj'al hadha al-ilm wiratha. Glory to Allah who didn't make this knowledge something that you genetically inherited. Because his son did not have his knowledge, but his daughter did. So these are signs. Now the other, I think that Allah Alam we can extrapolate and take an ishara from this, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I think one of the possible meanings of this hadith is that if you look at the word ama, ama is actually a very positive word. In fact, we call the female is called amatullah, like the male is called abdullah. If the ama is a servile creature, then the rabba is the one who is the master. Now, the idea of the mistress giving birth to the master, if you look at the Arabic words for habara, for darul islam, for uh, the thaqafa, for ma'rifa, most of these words you will find are feminine in nature. And the word actually for civilization, which is ummah or hadara, is a feminine word. Now one of the things that has happened in, in recent time, and I would say modern history, because modern history in a sense begins with the Renaissance, is that the Muslim ummah gave birth to Europe, quite literally. In other words, Europe was a completely abject, servile, ignorant society that had no knowledge whatsoever and through the knowledge that was transmitted by the Muslims the Muslims literally gave birth to a, a civilization that becomes the master of the Muslims in other words it's the Muslims who empowered Europeans and, and secondarily Americans to literally become the masters of the Islamic Ummah and we're living in an age where the Amma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the civilization that was in servitude to Allah, is now the slave of the arrogant, mutakabira, this arrogant and proudful uh, European civilization, which has no submission to the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and is in fact in, in absolute and utter rebellion to the traditions of the prophets. And extraordinarily enough, they have divorced themselves entirely from their own Christian tradition. And they mock their own prophets on their television programs and their comedians who make fun. <laughs> they take my signs and my messengers, not just the messenger of Allah, but Isa alayhi salam, and Musa alayhi salam, and Ibrahim alayhi salam, and Maryam, and all of the prophets. And this is not something you can just turn on your television and see them mocking these great uh, human beings. So this is the type of environment in which we're in, where literally Islam gave birth to a civilization that would take over and supersede the Islamic civilization and treat it like some abject servant that it orders about. And now in every single Muslim country, you see the servants, these pathetic, uh, barbaric, people who are ruling the masses of Muslims who are in abject servitude to their masters in the Pentagon and in Langley and in Washington DC and in London and in Paris and in Tokyo. This is the pathetic condition of the Ummah. So we literally see where this Ummah has now become an Amma. And the Amma is this Rabba, which is Western civilization and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now, the next thing the Prophet ﷺ, I mean, you could take many other meanings from that. I think one of the meanings that can possibly be extrapolated from that is the fact that now you also have rich women in this so-called first world, right? They call their world the first world. And the people in other places which they have derogatorily termed the third world, literally they rent their wombs. In other words, they go to poor people and women in Philippines and in South America and in India, and they rent the womb because they don't want to bother having a child. They don't want to get their stomachs wrinkled. And this happens in our day and age. This is happening. This is not something that's imaginary. It sounds like science fiction, but it's not. It's actually happening. Now, the next thing the Prophet ﷺ said, that you will see the barefoot, the ala, 
the barefooted destitute you will see the barefoot destitute the shepherds they will vie with one another in building exalted buildings now this again can be taken at many levels one of the ideas of bunyan in the quran is the ideology in other words, the bunyan of, of conceptualized constructs of thought. And these people vie in one another in trying to create better ways of ruling their societies and things like this. They have theorists who write whole books on what civilization should be and how people, what rules they should adhere to without any looking at the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or even their own traditions. But the, the obvious meaning is quite clearly the Bedouin of the uh, Arabian Peninsula who literally 40 years ago were barefoot, destitute and naked. Some of them during World War, uh, during the Great Depression had to make clothes and I've heard this from people who lived during that time had to make clothes from the palm leaves. From the palm leaves to cover their nakedness because it was so difficult to get cotton during that time. These people, and the Bedouin, traditionally, you would see the people were almost half naked out there because they had so little. And you will see them vying in building large buildings. Within our own lifetime, we've seen that. And I was in Dubai going in a taxi, and I saw an old building and a, a larger building next to it. And on the old building, there was new construction going on. And I said to the man, what are they doing there? And he said, Sheikh so-and-so built the first, the old one, and that was the biggest building in the whole area. And then another sheikh came, and he wanted to outdo him. So he built the second one, and then sheikh so-and-so got mad. So he's building another ser series of uh, stories in order to compete with so-and-so. And this man was a better one, and I said to him, the hadith, he didn't even know what it meant. And I told him, do you know this hadith? And, and then I explained him the meaning, and he just said, subhanAllah. You know, he, subhanAllah. Because he knew that he saw the ayah, but he didn't have the source to take it back to. So I was witnessing something the Sahaba believed in with Iman, and I was seeing it with my own eyes. A sign that the Prophet ﷺ would happen towards the end of time, which is extraordinary. Now another thing, يتطاولون في البنيان means according to Raghab al-Isbahani also to build by degrees and then break down and rebuild again. Now this is something unique to the 20th century. You will see whole buildings destroyed and flattened in order to build a new, bigger and larger building. So it can also have that meaning, which is happening all over in these cities, where they build a perfectly good building just to build. And that's, it's, it's israf, it's hadam, it's israf, it's absolute profligacy. And yet it happens. And we're witnessing it in our own time. So the Prophet ﷺ gave us these signs. Now from, I want to look briefly at some of these other signs. But I also want to just emphasize the importance of the fact that the, the fourth element mentioned in this hadith is the signs of the end of time. And when the hadith finishes, Omar ﷺ says, لَبِثْتُ مَلِيَّا أَيْسْ waited some time, and then asked the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet asked him, do you know, Umar? do you know who the one asking the question was? And he said, no. And he said, هذا Jibril. That was Jibril. أَتَاكُمْ لِيُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ He came in order to teach you your deen. Now what did he teach? He taught Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the Alamat al -sa And these people, the Sahaba, were waiting and watching to see the signs manifest. And Hudayfa ibn Yaman, radiallahu anhu, is one of the great scholars of the signs of the end of time. So amongst the Sahaba themselves, they had specialists that were specialists in this knowledge. And it is a knowledge. Now what I've noticed is that a lot of Muslims are almost embarrassed to mention the end of time. It's like you never hear it. And that in itself is a sign of the end of time. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يخرج الدجال إلا عن غفلة من الناس. The Dajjal will not come out until people have forgotten. And he said, وَيَتْرُكْ ذِكْرَهُ أَيْمَتُنَ عَلَى الْمَنَابِرِ And our Imams will leave his mention from the minbar. 
Now one of the things you never hear in khutbah is the mentioning of the Dajjal. I lived in the Middle East for almost 10 years and I never heard a khutbah on Masih al-Dajjal. And that in itself is a sign of the end of time. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned also that uh, people would yadhaluhu, they would forget about him, the Dajjal himself. Now, there are many signs that come before the actual Dajjal. And if you look, there is not one of them that has not manifested. Now, there is an argument that they were existing 500, 600 years ago. In fact, Ibn al-Hajj in his Madkhal, which was written in the 6th century, already is saying, and all the alamat of Sukhra are here. Wallahi, if he could be alive in our time, he would drop dead. He would pass out. Because he was living in a time when Fes, what he was from Fes, was a center of knowledge and civilization. There were ulama on every pillar. And he himself was saying that the signs were all there already. Now part of the beauty of that is that we should always be thinking about the sa'a. Because in reality, the sa'a is also our own death. Because that's called qiyamatu sughra or as sa'atu sughra the lesser hour, which is our own death. And so we will see within our own lives. And sakarat al-maut are like the zanzarat al-sa'a. They're like the shaking of that last hour. So those are there. Now if you look at the Christian tradition, they have some understanding of the last hour. And they will speak uh, to great length about it. And the odd thing about it is, they only have about five signs in their book. That's all they have. We literally have hundreds. Hundreds. They have like five or six signs. That the, uh, the, uh, there would be room, wars and rumors of wars. There would be famines and earthquakes in various places. Which we have all those signs. But then add all of the other signs. Sayyidina Ali al-Qudai relates a tradition by, from Sayyidina Ali which uh, to one of his companions asked him about the Dajjal. And he said, I can't tell you about the Dajjal, but I can tell you about the signs right before he comes. And then he mentioned several signs. Uh, in one way, it's almost about 70 signs. And from amongst them, he said that you would see people with amatu salah. They would literally, the prayer would become dead, lifeless, routine. It would be routine and also many people would leave it. Now in the Islamic civilization, leaving the prayer did not happen. You did not have tariq salah People left the prayer, if they left it, it was their own business. Nobody knew about it because they would literally be taken to the muhakamah. And this is a fact and you can see in the books of fiqh, it's mentioned about hukum tariq salah But it is a modern phenomenon in which the Muslims have left the prayer. And there are Muslims all over the world now who do not pray. Which is extraordinary because the Prophet ﷺ said in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, Al-Ahdu baini wa baynukum as-salah, fa man taraka salah faqad kafara. The, the oath between me, what's binding between me and you is the prayer. Whoever leaves the prayer has entered into kufr. Now, usually that's interpreted as kufran and ni'mah, and it's not a kufr, la yukhriju an al-millah, that it doesn't make them a non-Muslim unless they, they leave it uh, out of uh, not believing in it, ilhadan, like they don't believe in it or something like that. But Ahmed ibn Hanbal was the opinion, no, that they were kafir. If they didn't pray, they were kafir. Now one of the interesting things about it, and I think he, there's some strength in his position, although the other three imams uh, are opposed to that position and say that he's Muslim Asi, and he's buried with the Muslims. But if you look in the hadith that's in the Muat of Imam Malik, Imam Malik anhu relates a hadith in which the Prophet said he knows his ummah by the adhar al wudu. That that's how he's going to make shafa'ah for us. Because he'll see the white on our skin from the, which means the light from the wudu. Like ghurmu hajjaleen. Like the horses that have the white on their legs and on their forehead. Now if people aren't doing wudu, then where's the light? There's no light. And if there's no light, then how is the Messenger of Allah going to know them? And there will be some that he says, Ta'alu, Ta'alu, come, come. And the angels say, No, Badru min ba'dik. They change things after you left. And he said, Suhqan, Suhqan. Go distance yourselves from me. So people should have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because these are enormous affairs. Now one of the signs of the end of time also is the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تروا أمورا عظاما يتفاقم شأنها عندكم حتى يقول أحدكم هل ذكر نبيكم شيئا من هذه الأشياء? 
that the end of time will not come until you see amazing things, unbelievable things, umuran idama, grandiose things, things that just are unbelievable. And then he said, يَتَفَاقَمُوا شَأْنُهَا فِي صُدُورِكُمْ the, this matter will become increasingly, increasingly grave towards you. It's matter, the affair. Tafaqum is things that move towards a critical head, where people become more, increasingly more concerned. Now if you look now at what's happening in the world, things are becoming so frightening that people are becoming increasingly more concerned and increasingly more confused at the same time. And the Prophet ﷺ said that in those days, يُصْبِحُ الْمَرْءُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا A man will wake up in the morning a believer and go to sleep a kafir. And, the, and he also warned about people would go just to see the Dajjal. يَحْسِبُ نَفْسُهُ مُؤْمِنًا He'll think that he's a mu'min. But he will become confused by the arguments of the Dajjal. The Dajjal will literally confuse his mind, his intellect. And he warned us, the Prophet ﷺ, but let me get to these other matters. The Prophet ﷺ said, نِكَاحُ الْمَرْأَةِ بِالْمَرْأَةِ وَالرَّجُلْ بِالرَّجُلْ That a man will marry a man, and a woman will marry a woman. And he said, نِكَاح. And it doesn't mean zina, because... At that time, things like that were happening. They knew about zina. The zina is mentioned in the Qur'an. He said, nikahul mar'ati, which its primary meaning is marriage. That a man will marry a man, and a woman will marry a woman. And now this is in the legislation in the Supreme Court in the United States of America, in which they have legalized in certain states the marriage of two of the same sex. Become legal. And we're witnessing this in our own time. And this is going to become a norm. Now one of the other things that the Prophet ﷺ said, يَسْتَغْنِي الرِّجَالِ بِالرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاء بِالنِّسَاء That you will see people feel uh, sexually satisfied, uh, a male with a male and a female with a female. Again becoming an increasingly uh, gross matter in, in the uh, cities all over the world. The proliferation of homosexuality and lesbianism. Unbelievable things that people, wallahi, 20, 30 years ago, even in these countries, people couldn't openly admit these things, they would lose their jobs. And this is becoming a norm. Within our own lifetime, in the last few years, these things are becoming norms. This is something phenomenal, really. And we're, I think we're just all asleep. We're just watching these things happen in the daydreams. I mean, we have to really think about these things. These are deeply uh, frightening matters that we should be concerned about that our children are growing up in environments in which human beings grow, they're not even human beings less than human beings worse than animals because even the animals don't do that and they'll try to use proof that monkeys uh, have homosexuality amongst them and the Prophet ﷺ and the Qur'an uses the monkey as the lowest example, the lowest metaphor for a human being. In fact, he said in the end of time, people would, the yusbihuna, they'll dance all night with, and he said, ala ru'usihim and ma'asif, on their heads are musical instruments. And Allah now people wear these things on their head, over their head, these phones, and they dance to musical instruments that are on their heads. That are tape recorded and radios and these things. And he said, They'll yusbihuna qarada wa khanazir. They'll wake up monkeys and pigs. And this is called masq. And the masq of the people of the last days is an internal masq. It doesn't mean they literally take the forms of monkeys and pigs. Their inner reality will be monkeys and pigs. So homosexuality, yes, you do find it amongst the monkeys. And But the fact is, that is what you're imitating. We imitate Bani Adam. We imitate the prophets. We want to be like the Siddiqun, wa shuhada, wa salihun. We don't want to be like monkeys and pigs. So that you use as a proof for your own deviations, the monkey and pig is a sign of your own gross, pathetic state and condition. And yet these things are put forward like they're rational arguments or something like that. Unbelievable conditions. Umur an idama. The Prophet ﷺ said, that people, he said, that people would drive up to the masjids. And he said, عَلَى مَآثِرْ يَرْكَبُونَ مَآثِرْ Which means they would ride very elegant seats. Now, ma'athir was the seats of the kings. The seats of the kings 
would be considered like now the seats of cars. They're like uh, king seats of the ancient times. The kings were the ones that rode in the closed uh, c- uh, containers like a hodaj for women. The noble women used to ride in the hodaj, which was very similar to a car. It looks like a car in its outward form. And the Prophet ﷺ said they would drive right up on a abwab in the masjid. Now in the old days, they didn't bring the animals near the masjid. So it doesn't make any sense that they would drive right up to the... And he said that those people would come in and pray and their women would be naked. Kasiyat adiyat. Their women would be naked. And they would go in and they, they would pray. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لا خلاق لهم. They have no khalaq. They have no portion of the akhirah. And he said, Mal'unun. They're people that are cursed. They're sick people. I mean, this is the type of condition that we're in. It's unbelievable. We're literally daydreaming, going through life daydreaming. The Prophet ﷺ said that you will see, he said, Sinfani min ahl al-nar, lam, min ummatihi. From my ummah, Sinfani min ahl al-nar, lam arahuma. I haven't seen them. And then he said, the first one, he said, Rijalun, lahum asyatun ka aznab al-ibal, ka aznab al-baqar, yadribun al-nas. They would be, have uh, these aznab like, uh, the tails of, of donkeys, of cows, which are the whips that these uh, uh, disgusting, despicable uh, soldiers of these tyrants in the Muslim countries, and you see them carrying their sticks, and this is the interpretation that Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shinqiti gave, that these are the police that do the orders of the tyrants, and they go and they beat the people, and this is happening in all of the prisons and the jails in the Muslim countries right now. People that pray and fast, young men and women that pray and fast are being beaten by these these despicable, less than human beings. And they're from, those people are for the fire. And they have no excuse before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say that we're just doing what we were told. Even the kuffar reject that as a proof. And you look at the Nuremberg trials when they condemn those people who said, we were just following orders. No, you have a conscience. You've been given a damir by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have to reflect on that fact. You have to reflect on that. Because Allah says that, Fir'aun wa Haman wa junuduhuma. Fir'aun and Haman and his armies, all of them are in the wrong. You can't just say, oh, I was just following orders. That's not an excuse with Allah. لا طاعت لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There is no following the created one if you, it means disobeying the, the creator. And this is what the Islam came to take us out of this ibadah, this عبودية للمخلوقين, the, the worship of created things. This is the pre-Islamic disease of the Persians and the Romans. The Arabs, interestingly enough, did not worship their leaders. This is something they learned from the Persians and the Romans. Following the Ajam, that tattabi'anna sunan alladhina sanan alladhina min qabrikum shibran bi shibran, dhira'an bi dhira'an, hatta law dakhara juhara tabin la dakhaltumu, that you will follow the other peoples. And the interesting thing, now they've left the worship of divine kings. See, these Europeans have left all that. The worship of their rulers. I mean, they, they uh, throw them out of office. But the Muslims now, everywhere you look, there's statues and pictures of these tyrants. And the Muslims, they put their picture out of fear in their, in their hawanit of the thing. You go to Syria and you, somebody who doesn't have the picture of, of this uh, khain in that place, he doesn't have the picture and somebody going, what's the matter? Don't you like the uh, hawanit? Don't you like him? Something wrong with you? Where's the picture? Like it's Ubudiyah. And he's too afraid to say, right? The angel doesn't come in a house where there's a picture and a dog, so what about a picture of a dog? They're too afraid to say that. And really, from one sense, we can't blame them. You know? Wallahi. I mean, we should have pity. A shafaqa ala ummati Muhammadan, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We should have pity for these people. And many of them have suffered because of their, just not even speaking out, just not conforming, just not going along with it. So I'm not in any way making fun of those people. Really, we should have shafaqa and rahma for those people. It's a wretched condition to be in, but this is our state. And many signs, the Prophet ﷺ said, zakah would be seen as maghram, like it's some kind of fine. People wouldn't pay zakat. I mean, if you had zakat al-fitr, just of the Eid al-fitr, there would be no starvation in the world. If one billion people gave the, the, the zakat that they're supposed to give, and there must be something going on. Where is all that zakat going to? 
I want to know, where's it going? If one billion people are paying zakat al-fitr, where's it going to? I mean, really, have you thought about that? Every Ramadan, each one of us is supposed to take for every member of the family the, 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 the amount of grain to take to the poor people. So why are the people dying of starvation? And people in Muslim countries, in Somalia, died of starvation. In Iraq now, dying of starvation. This is not exaggeration, it's not making up people dying of starvation. In Muslim countries, where's the zakat? Why isn't it being sent there? Because the governments hoard it. That's what they do. They collect zakat and then they just hoard it. And this is part of this whole tribulation that we're in. The Prophet ﷺ said, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا هِمَّتُكُمْ بُطُونَكُمْ What's your state when your highest aspirations are just your button, your, your stomachs? And that means لُقْمَةَ الْعَيْشِ That's ma'isha. That all you care about is your livelihood. It's just how to fill your stomachs. كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا هِمَّتُكُمْ إِلَى بُطُونِكُمْ وَأُمُورُكُمْ إِلَى نِسَائِكُمْ and your matters go to uh, the women folk. Which is not a denigration of women. But the dunya affairs are to be uh, the affair of the woman's domain is the domestic domain. She is the Rabbat al-Manzil. But the man is supposed to be taking care of the society at Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi an al-Munkar. And one of the meanings of that is when men behave like women. Because the Prophet ﷺ said at the end of time, for every one man there would be 50 women. And many ulama have interpreted that to mean they would be fi maqam al nisa. Because like I mentioned last night, the rijal is a maqam, it's a station. And there would be only one qayyim, fi khamsin. It means there would be only one upright person who was able to fulfill the deeds, the, 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 those things that Allah has made incumbent on them. So all of these things of this end of time is just extraordinary. Now I just want to briefly just, I mean, I could go on and on because I've read too much about this stuff and it just, it, it just really, it'll get you, uh, you know, it'll put you into a very, and you know, I'm, subhanAllah. Because it's happening all around, I just feel like we're, we're, we're just like asleep, we're sleepwalking, just in a daze. And that's a type of reaction psychologically. People become numb, they, be, they can't, they, they have this uh, desensitization, they stop feeling things, they stop, their hearts die. And that's one of the signs of the end of time, Mawtul Qulub. And Ibn Abi Jamra said, قَدْ يَكُونَ حَقِيقَةً وَقَدْ يَكُونَ مَجَازًا Maybe it's in reality. Now one of the phenomena of the modern society is the sudden death of the heart attack. Literally hearts die. And traditionally that was very rare. That disease didn't, people didn't have CAD because they didn't eat the, the, the fats that they eat now. And the Prophet ﷺ said one of the signs of the end of time was uh, fat plumpness. People would be fat. And he said, Bawasir, Tadhar al Bawasir, which means people would have hemorrhoids, which is an extraordinary hadith and it's a sound hadith, which indicates people would sit around all day doing nothing because that's the way you get those things. If you're out working and moving about, you don't get that stagnation. It's a liver stagnation even in Western medicine where there's no, the liver is not detoxifying and you get this stagnation in the veins. So there's not proper circulation because people aren't moving about. And that was something that old people got, not young people. Now in Western civilization and I, my time in the hospital, it was like prison, the time that I spent in the hospital, well, I, I just, everybody has bawasir. It's amazing. And, and I saw it as a sign of the end of time. I just said, Sadaqa Rasulullah. Sadaqa Rasulullah. I mean, it's amazing that he even mentioned that. Because he was a very shy man. And he didn't mention things, you know, that uh, he was very shy about. But he's telling us so that we can know, so we recognize the age we're living in. Now, the importance of all this, and just to say a few things about the Dajjal. First of all, the Dajjal is, there are many interpretations of the Dajjal. I think the best interpretations of the Dajjal is to actually look in the Arabic language at what the word means itself. Because the Qur'an and the Hadith are revealed in the Arabic language. So you always have to look at the Arabic language. What does the Lisan al-Arab say? Now Dajjal has many meanings. The most primary meaning is an imposter. And this is used by Imam Malik anhu when somebody asked, he, he was asked about a man who was a muhaddith and he said, huwa Dajjalun min al He's an imposter from the imposters. Now, the man who related that said, 
That was the first time I ever heard anybody uh, p- put the Dajjal with Dajjajila, because normally it's Dajjalun. So the point being is that he was saying the man was pretending to be something he wasn't. That's what he was doing. And that is the first and primary meaning of the Dajjal. It is somebody who is pretending to do something that he is not. Now what the Messiah Dajjal does is he's pretending to be the Messiah. Now if you look at the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah Ibn Maryam, is called Ruh Allah. He's called the Spirit of Allah, which does not mean in any way that he was divine like Saint John of Damascus, Yahya Damishqi, tried to say to the Muslims, in fact, it began the whole fitna of Khalq al-Qur'an, because the Qur'an is called Karima, Isa is called Karima, and is the Qur'an makhluq or ghayr makhluq, because Karimatullah is sifa min sifatillah, and the sifa is ghayr makhluqa, and so Isa is ghayr makhluq, so he's God. This is the type of rationalization or argumentation that the Christians were using, which is a sign that they were thinking too, they weren't stupid people. And the Muslims, Yahya Damashqi, actually argued with the ulama in, in the presence of Muawiyah. There was an inter-religious dialogue between the St. John of Damascus at the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Qasr of Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu. And the ulama argued and they defeated him. Now the point being is that the uh, Isa alayhi salam is literally the embodiment of spirituality. He is the embodiment of the ruh. And the ruh is the opposite of the jasad. And part of his mission was to take people that were immersed in gross materialism and take them into spirituality. Now part of what the Dajjal will do is take people who are immersed in deep spirituality and put them into gross materialism. And if you will look at the phenomenon that is taking place all over the world now is people are turning away from the spirit and moving completely into the dunya as if the dunya is a savior. People now believe that they will be fulfilled and happy by being successful in this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, قُلْ هَلْ نُنَبِّعُكُمْ بِرَخْسَرِينَ عَمَالًا how should we not, and this is one of the ayahs that you're supposed to read to protect you from the Dajjal. Should we not tell you those who will lose everything? الَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Those who have completely lost all of their endeavors in the life of this world. وَهُمْ يَحْسِبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسُونَ صُنْعًا And they reckon, they think that they are doing good actions. Now the word in Arabic, Allah could have said عَمَلًا وَهُمْ يَحْسِبُونَ or يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسُونَ عَمَلًا Allah could have said that. But he said, Sun'a. Now if you look at the word Sun'a, it to, means to manufacture. When you make something, it's not an action. In other words, if I amiltu amalan saliha, it means I did a good action, but you don't say Sun'a'tu amalan saliha. You don't say that in the Arabic language. Sun'a means that you make something with your hands. That's the word that it means. And they think that they're making good things with their hands. Now one of the meanings of Dujjal in the Arabic language is people that spread their merchandise all over the world. And you can look it right up there in Nisan al-Arab. That that is one of the meanings. That it's a group of people that spread their goods, their manufactured goods all over the world. Now the other meaning of Dajjal means to spread the earth to cover it with filth. And literally the word in Arabic, and I, I won't use a foul word, but the word in Arabic literally means crap that they will spread the earth with crap. And if there's one thing that sums up the age we're in, it's that the earth has been flooded with foulness. Completely flooded with foulness. Both psychological pollution, which nobody ever talks about. You can't even go into a store without having music piped into your head. Nobody talks about air pollution, uh, the the air pollution of of sound, of the sound waves that are filled. I mean, right now I can take a, a box and turn it on and get all of this madness. This rap music and this rock music and all of this sickness, it's floating about in the atmosphere. And I, I really, I think, and you might think I'm crazy, I don't care. I think that's having an effect on people's heads. Because we're like transmitters. The brain is like a transmitter. And people are walking around all confused. They're walking around in these states and conditions, really sick. People are sick. There's people walking around all over the place talking to themselves. And you see people driving around. The Prophet ﷺ said, and it's a sound hadith. Remember Allah until they say he's mad. And what does that mean? That people see that he's always moving his mouth. 
because that was a sign of mad people. And now you see people driving all over in their cars, singing these stars. And they're, they're in a state of madness. Because that's not remembering Allah. That's remembering dunya. All those songs about dunya, you see some old man singing love songs. You know, I mean, people, you, I, one of the things I used to hear from these patients, these older people, they would tell me, I can't sleep at night. What? And I used to tell people, really, that's the whole point. When you get old, you're not supposed to sleep at night. <laughs> that's something you do when you're young. When you get old, you're supposed to be thinking about akhirah, thinking about dying. So insomnia, it, there's no insomnia for the Muslim. Insomnia just means you're supposed to be up doing ibadah. It's a gift from Allah. I mean, people used to love that they, did, they didn't feel tired at night. They used to praise Allah for that state. In fact, coffee, with the Yemeni scholar Abu Hassan al-Shadri, not the uh, famous Moroccan, but the Yemeni scholar Abu Hassan al-Shadri, who's attributed with the discovery of coffee in Yemen, was a Yemeni scholar who kept sleeping at night, and he wanted to do tahajjud. And so he had a dream in which an angel came to him and showed him the bun tree and showed him how to make the bun and taught him. And that's why the Yemenis to this day, now they drink coffee just to talk all night. But in the old days, they used to drink it to memorize the Quran. And to this day, the ulama of Yemen, and I heard this from more than one, they used to praise qahwa because they said, Biha hafitu kitab Allah. With that drink, I memorized the book of Allah. Or biha hafitu ilm so they used to praise it, and in the books, the Maliki books, when the qahwa first came, because qahwa in the Arabic language is one of the words for wine, in classical Arabic, and there was a debate, like the Mormons consider it prohibited, but there was a debate whether it was uh, intoxicant, because if you have never drinking coffee, and you drink, especially like Turkish coffee, you'll think something, this is serious stuff, it's like a drug. And... And so they debated. And what they decided was, if the person drank it to do ibadah or to study at night, then it was a good thing. But if they drank it just for uh, tharthara, just to talk and emptiness, then they considered it had karahiya, that, that, that it was something that should be avoided. That was the original debate. And then they moved into ibahiya, which is usually where the later ulama go. Everything becomes mubah, right? And that's, I mean, I, we don't fault them because the ulama the rightly guided ulama would always try to find maharaj for the Muslim. They would always look for ways to kind of help the Muslims out. Like if you look at the early ulama, all of them, and I only one, I think there's only one alim that was mentioned that Qad Ayyad radiallahu anhu mentioned qawl bil karahiyya fi halq al lahya that uh, cutting the beard was makru. All the other ulama considered it was nahi lit tahrim when the Prophet prohibited it and told people, Afu liha, because al-amr and al usuliyin lil wujub. The, when a, the Prophet or Allah commands something, it's for uh, wujub, unless there's a clear proof that it's for uh, karahiya or for uh, istihbab, uh, something that's mustahab. So initially they said, everybody said it was har, uh, haram. Then the later ulama in Egypt, because so many of the uh, people who started shaving their beards, they came with the weak opinion and said it was makru, and that's what you hear now. Now those ulama, did, they had beards. So they were doing it to find makhraj for the people without beards. But now you find the ulama don't have beards. So everything's gone wrong. I mean, if the, if the anim doesn't have a beard, he becomes a hujjah for people. They say, well, Sheikh so-and-so doesn't have a beard. You know, why should I grow a beard? And people, that's what stupid people do. You know, they, they look, well, you say, well, the Prophet ﷺ had a beard. Isn't that a good reason to grow one? I mean, they don't, they don't go the opposite way. They go the wrong way. It's amazing, human beings. Self-deception, ghurur. Fascinating subject. Well, how we get deceived. So, all of these, I did now, I would like to say, I think that the Dajjal is a human being. There are Groups that have said that the Dajjal is, a, uh, is the Christian, they've identified him as Western societies, and that's something you will find. Akbar Ahmed uh, did that in his book. Um, uh, and I, as far as I know, I don't think he's a scholar, but he, he wrote a book uh, about the Western civilization being the Dajjal. There's also a book uh, written by Mawlana Muhammad Ali, uh, which is about that subject. And he was from the Lahori Ahmadiyya, who are all, they're not considered kuffar, there's two Ahmadi sects. One of them is Kafir, and the other one, they're, uh, they're uh, Fusaq, Fil Aqidah. 
they have uh, corruption in their understanding of the deen. And Muhammad Ali was from that group. And uh, he wrote a book also identifying it as the Christians, that it was the Western Hemisphere. Now, I personally think, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, that there are three dominant aspects to the Dajjal phenomenon. One of them is the social system that is being prepared for the Dajjal. And what that is, is that there, if you look on the dollar bill, the pyramid with the eye, the one eye, which is hovering above the pyramid, the pyramid is being built in order for the Dajjal, the final piece, to come onto the pyramid. Now, the fascinating thing about that pyramid is if you look at the pyramid, it's three-dimensional. In other words, it has abad. But if you look at the eye, the eye is one-dimensional. It doesn't have depth. And, but yet it's the top of the pyramid. Now, one of the things about being one-eyed, if you know anything about physiology, if you are one-eyed, you do not have depth perception. You cannot see, if you put your hand over your eye, what happens is you lose depth perception and your vision becomes one-dimensional. And this is the nature of the one-eyed Dajjal. His vision is one-dimensional. He only sees the outward of the world. He has no depth and no understanding. Now, one of the things that he will do, like Isa, who literally purified people and allowed, uh, they were purified of their wrong actions. He will purify people of their wrong actions also. But he won't purify them by having them make tawbah to Allah. He will purify them. In other words, he will uh, defile them by saying there is no wrong actions. You see, this is what he'll do. He'll say there is no wrong actions. There's no fornication, nothing wrong with that. One of the signs of the end of time, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِثَارُ zina عَلَى nikah." People would prefer fornication to marriage. It's in the hadith. Now the other thing, أَكْثَرُ أَتْبَعَ الدَّجَّالِ أَوْلَادُ zina. The majority of the followers of the Dajjal will be children of illegitimate sex. Now in the United States, it has almost or has already overcome the 50% mark. In other words, the majority of children born in the United States now are illegitimate children. They are called by Sharia, awladu zina. And one of the beauties of Islam is that we accept the marriages of any traditional religion. If they have a marriage, like if two Christians become Muslim, as a, mother, a male and a female, they do not have to remarry by sharia. Ah. Their marriage is considered valid because they believe in the, the, the tradition of marriage, nikah. But at the end of time, there would be no nikah. And, and this system tells people there's nothing wrong with it. That you don't have to get married. And now, and this I'm telling you, this is our lifetime. Because when I was growing up, people did not live together like they do now. And that's in my own lifetime. It was something that was just beginning to happen when I was a child. And yet now you'll see most people, you know it's become the norm. And people will get, and their marriage doesn't mean anything because most of them get married by the courts, which is not a religious marriage and is not sanctified by Islam. Islam only accepts marriage through a religious tradition. A tradition of a secular type marriage, that is not. A judge has no authorization because marriage is an institution given to man by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not given by other human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed marriage to all of the religions that He sent down to human beings. So it is Allah alone who gives the right to marriage. And that's why we accept the previous revelatory dispensations that they have the right to marry their people because it was a right given to them by Allah. Just like they can sacrifice animals, the Jew and the Christian, they have a right to kill animals. We can eat those animals because that's part of their deen that still remains, that is intact. Now, to get where I'm going to, <laughs> I want to uh, look at what has happened in this system. A couple of other fascinating things before I go on. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that Imam Ahmad relates in his Musnad that the Dajjal ass. Now, an ass, a uh, himar, is that was the dominant markab of uh, city Arabs. Not the desert Arabs rode camels, but the city Arabs rode donkeys. And so the Prophet ﷺ was articulating their, the vehicle of movement. And he said that the Dajjal in Kanz al-Umal, there's a hadith that said the Dajjal would jump between the clouds and the earth. And in a riwayah, and it's a sahih hadith, 
the Prophet ﷺ, when he said that Dajjal would enter every single city on the earth except Mecca and Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ, they asked him, كَيْفَ سُرْعَتُهُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ How would he travel that fast, Ya Rasulullah? And he said, كَرِيحَنَ اسْتَدْبَرَتْهُ sahab, Like a cloud uh, that is pushing the, by the wind. Now if you look, an airplane, sahab means condensation in scientific language. The cloud that you see left behind by, it's called the jet stream or the condensation of the jet. That's what it is. It's water that mixes with the uh, I, uh, uh, oxygen, nitrogen in the air. And it's literally a cloud. It's an artificial cloud. It's a sahab. And if you watch the jet planes, they leave, they look like a cloud that's pushing a wind. That's a, that is a brilliant scientific description for uh, movement by jet uh, airplane. Is that thunder? Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> I, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm going to put it up. This is an advertisement, and it's got two people there uh, in their Mercedes Benz. That's the one of the signs of the success in this dunya. Uh, man with the woman there, and they're looking at something. And you can go into these esoteric uh, interpretations of these things, but the interesting thing about this ad is that you see, this audience has arrived and they want jazz, a strong concentration of affluent, highly educated, performance-oriented consumers. The vehicle to attract, reach, and keep this audience is bet on jazz. Now, the interesting thing about this uh, ad is that you will not see it in Time or Newsweek. Because if you notice, the commodity that's being sold in the ad is the people. You see, that's what, this is an ad that comes out of a magazine that is only for advertisers. And it costs about $100 to subscribe to a year. The only thing, you can't even buy it at most stores. You, you buy it at very specialized stores. Most people do not read this. People in merchant advertising and, and things read this. So what the ad is saying is, here's your commodity. We'll sell you their minds. How will we sell you their minds? Because they listen to jazz. So if you put your commercial on our station, we have access to them. And what do they tell you about them? A strong concentration of affluent, highly educated performance-oriented consumers. In other words, these are not normal consumers. They're performance-oriented. And this is how they describe people. You see, they describe people by if you're a passive consumer, if you're like a couch potato that just sits around watching TV all day long. They have different things to sell different people. They do studies to find out what type of music you listen to, what type of cars you buy. If you want to read a book about this, it's called The Naked Consumer. And on, interestingly enough, on the cover is The Pyramid with the One Eye. And it's a book which is about the, the deep tejesus, which is spying that's going on of human beings. They will literally monitor all of your actions to see what type of people you are. They've already identified that, for instance, in this country, Indo-Pak people tend to be status-oriented. This is how they're determined in these books, and I've got the evidence for this. They've studied the Indo-Pak uh, people that have moved to these countries, and they call them status-oriented people. In other words, they want to buy Mercedes Benz. They want to have nice clothes. They want to buy gold. They want to have these trappings of dunya to make them feel good. We've made it. We've arrived. We're here. And then there's that weak little takbir on the day of Eid. Right? The embarrassment that they have about being Muslim. Subhanallah. And obviously I'm not condemning uh, there are many very good people from those places, but I'm telling you, this is how they're looking at the majority of them. And you live amongst them. You know what they say about the Arabs? The Arabs are not uh, brand name loyal. <laughs> they look for the bargain. You see, they don't want to buy the brand name. They want to buy what's, you know, because Arabs have a tradition of bartering. They look for the deal. You see, they want to find the cheapest thing, right? 
which, alhamdulillah, that's actually a virtuous thing. It's not a negative thing, but the point is, this is how they're looking at these people. That's how they have commodified you. You are a commodity that is bought and sold to other corporations. And that is what we have become. We're a commodity. And this is the commodification of the world. And the Prophet ﷺ said, one of the signs of the end of time, fashu tijara. There would be commerce everywhere. And he said that, that, that al maratu تُعِينُ زَوْجَهَا عَلَى التِّجَارَةَ حِرْصًا فِي الدُّنْيَا That a woman would work in the dunya, in commerce, like with her husband, covetous for the dunya, loving the dunya. Women going to work in the marketplace, leaving their children to be tended by people that have no compassion for them, by people paid five dollars an hour, or whatever the going rate is, to raise their children just so they can have that dunya. You see, this is the type of culture that we're living in. So what does this all mean for us? And why am I even talking about all of this? I'm talking about because I think that we should be aware of the age we're living in and the, the, the depth of understanding that we need to have in order to make sense of this time. Now, the important thing about this, uh, about this age, and, well... I didn't, I didn't even get into Jasasa because there's a whole... It's getting late already, subhanAllah. The Jasasa, which is the, the spy of the Dajjal, and in the hadith by Tamim al-Dari in Sahih Muslim, لا يعرف دبره من قبره You wouldn't know its front from its back. And, and he's covered in, in hair. In other words, it doesn't even look like a human. It's just hair. It's like wires. And wallahi, Allahu alam. But one of the elements of the jasasa that I think is now all of this modern internet telecommunications, which you don't know where it begins and where it ends. Nobody knows where the internet begins, where it ends. And this is constant monitoring of people. You go with your credit card now, they're literally eliminating cash. That's their goal. And they've already articulated these goals. This is not some kind of uh, craziness. They want to eliminate the use of cash so that they can monitor all transactions. They want to monitor all of transactions so that human transactions are monitored and they have absolute knowledge of everything that's being bought and sold. Which in, according to the San al-Arab, one of the meanings of the Dajjal is the one that knows what's in the souq. It knows what's in the marketplace, you see. Now, I personally think, again, I was saying that there's a social system, there's also a general state of chaos in the earth where people are literally like mad people, crazy, dancing like lunatics, uh, drunk, and all of these, the, just what's going on. And, but then there is the individual. The Prophet ﷺ said the majority of his followers will be awladu zina, which is already being prepared in the western countries. You see, all of these people are going to be within a short time, they're all going to be uh, illegitimate children. Quite literally. It's already happening, and this has happened in our lifetime. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I will tell you something about the Dajjal that nobody has told their people uh, before, none of the Prophets, that he's A'war, he has one eye. That's something we know about the Dajjal that they don't know. Now I'd just like to read something briefly from uh, Lewis Mumford who wrote this in 1962, which I think is phenomenal that he wrote this at that time. In Egyptian theology, and and this society is built, whether we like it or not, they, this society is built on the pharaonic model. And this is why even in, if you go to Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. is designed in 10 square miles. It is designed on the pattern of the Great Pyramid at Cheops. And the White House is literally exactly lies in the same geometrical proportions as the sarcophagus where the pharaoh was supposed to lie. And they have done this quite consciously. They know exactly what they're doing. And they have embalmed their leaders. You see, this is part of what you, when you go to Washington, you see these embalmed leaders where they go and, and worship their so-called uh, forefathers. Now, the other thing you'll see, the, the obelisk, which is the um, uh, Cleopatra's needle, they call it, which is from the Egyptian symbol as well. It's called Washington's Monument. And you will see many uh, geometric designs which were based on the astronomers of ancient Egypt who were building the pyramid. This is the social system that they're building, this social order in which they want to bring people in. Now, one of the interesting things in the Quran is it said, لَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَا نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتُهُمْ Now, Allah said, حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتُهُمْ And didn't say, دِينَهُمْ 
You see, Allah could have said, حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ دِينَهُمْ But Allah said, مِلَّتُهُمْ Now if you look at the difference between deen and millah, deen is your individual relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَدِينُ islam. But your millah is the collective social reality. So what this means is that the, the Jews and the Christians will not stop until they'll let you keep your deen, but you have to follow their milla, which is their collective social system. And this is what has been done all over the Muslim world. We are now in the milla of the Jew and the Christian. We no longer have our milla. The milla of the Prophet Muhammad, which is the collective reality, has been dismantled because it's the social system of Islam. Now the Prophet ﷺ said, if you leave the book, the Hukmu ilallahi wa rasulihi, la yusallitanna Allahu alaykum aduwan min ghayri anfusikum. When you leave the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, o kama qal, and you leave the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa then Allah will subjugate you to tyrants from outside of your own selves. And this is the situation that we're in. We left the tahakum ilallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so we were given taghut over us. And that's our condition. Now he says in Egyptian theology, the most singular organ of the sun god Ray was the eye. Because the Egyptian, the pharaonic model, they believed in a, a one-eyed god, Ray. For the eye of Ray had independent existence and played a creative and directive part in all cosmic and human activities. Now he says in, in 1962, the computer turns out to be the eye of the reinstated sun god, that is the eye of the mega machine, serving as its private eye or detective. Now this is a non-Muslim that doesn't even know anything about Jasasa or these things. And I'm amazed that Muslims can't even identify this stuff. This is a guy that doesn't even have the basic, he's just doing it from his intellect. Serving as its private eye or detective, as well as the omnipresent executive eye. He who exacts absolute conformity to his commands. Because no secret can be hidden from him, and no disobedience can go unpunished. And the Prophet ﷺ said, anyone that disobeys the Dajjal, سَيَكُنُ fi جُهْدٍ إِلَّا مَنَ اتَّبَعْهُ He will be struggling to survive except those who follow him. And this is why he شَرُّ فِتْنَةٍ يُنْتَظَرْ the worst of all fitness, seductions that people wait for. The principal means needed to operate the mega machine correctly and efficiently were a concentration of power, political, economic, instantaneous communication, rapid transportation, and a system of information storage capable of keeping track of every event within the province of the divine king. Once these accessories were available, the central establishment would also have a monopoly of both energy and knowledge. And this is what they have now. You see, they have a monopoly of energy, which is the oil. That's the energy of the age and of what's called the information. They have all the information. They're storing it. No such complete assemblage had been available to the rulers of pre-scientific ages. Transportation was slow. Communication over distance remained erratic. Confined to written messages, information stores. All these things could be destroyed by fire and military assault, etc., etc. Then he says, with nuclear energy, electronic communication, and the computer, all the necessary components of a modernized mega machine at last became available. Heaven had been brought near. Theoretically, at the present moment, 1962, and actually soon in the future, God, that is the computer, will be able to find, to locate, and to address instantly by voice and image via the priesthood any individual on the planet exercising control over every detail of the subject's daily life by commanding a dossier which would include his parentage and birth, his complete educational record, an account of his illnesses and his mental breakdowns, if treated, his marriage, his sperm bank account, his income, loans, security payments, taxes, pensions, and finally the disposition of such further organs as may be surgically extracted for him just prior to the moment of his official death. Because you can't die unless they officially pronounce you dead. In, in a hospital... If you're a nurse, you cannot say the guy's dead. It has to be this priest comes in his white suit and, and says, he's dead. You know, and and, and the, the nurse has to say, oh, oh, thank you for enlightening us. In the end, no action, no conversation, and possibly in time, no dream or thought would escape the wakeful and relentless eye of this deity. Every manifestation of life would be processed into the computer and brought under its all-pervading system of control. Now he says this does not simply mean the invasion of privacy. It means the dissolution of the human soul. 
And, and this, is, this is what we're in. This is the situation. And the Prophet ﷺ said that, uh, and this was the whole point of this talk. He said, if the end of time comes upon you, either the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا قَامَتَ السَّعَى وَبِأَحَدِكُمْ فَسِيلَةٌ إِنْ إِسْتَطَعَنْ يَغْرِسَهَا فَلْيَغْرِسْهَا And it's a sound hadith that uh, Al-Bukhari doesn't relate in his Sahih, but it's in the other collection. This hadith says, if the end of time comes upon you and you're planting a tree, in your hand is a seed, and you have the ability to finish planting it, then finish planting it. In other words, we have to know the age we're living in and not be fooled, but at the same time, this should in no way put despair in our hearts. Because we know Al-Aqibatu lil muttaqin This is the first thing. The second thing we know also that this system will be destroyed. It will be destroyed. Either in our lifetimes or after our lifetimes. But this system will be destroyed. By the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet ﷺ told us in a sound hadith that Al-Khilafah ستكون الخلافة على منهج النبوة ثلاثين عاما and the rawi of that hadith said I counted it to the six months of Hassan uh, ibn Ali and I found it was exactly 30 years just like the Prophet ﷺ said and you can count it yourself the Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali and then Hassan for the six months equals ثلاثين سنة and that's the hadith and then the Prophet said it will be muluk, abba it will be kings that hold on to their uh, kingdom with uh, ferocious authority. And then he said, and then it will be Jababira, the tyrants, which is the age we're in now, the age of Jabbar. That's what all of these rulers are. They're called Jababira in the Arabic language. And you, every Arab knows that, whether they know the hadith or not. If you say, Ta'araf al Jabbar fi fil Iraq, and he'll say, Naam, Saddam Hussein. Like you don't even have to, you just say, Ta'araf al Jabbar fi Syria, Naam. Hafid Asad, Ta'araf al-Jabbar fi Masr, Naam, Husni Mubarak, Ta'araf al-Jabbar fi Libya, Naam, Mu'amr al-Qadhafi, Ta'araf al-Jabbar fi al-Jazar, Naam, Ta'araf al-Jabbar fi... Every single country you will see and they'll give you the right answer. It's a test no Muslim who has any political astuteness can fail. Now, what then do we do? What's the seed that we hold in our hand? The seed that we hold in our hands is the deen of Islam. Because the deen, you have to have a qabwa. The Prophet ﷺ said in the end of time, holding on to the deen would be holding on to a coal, but you still have to hold on to it. In other words, it's painful, it's difficult. Holding on to coal is hard. And it, it's, it's, you have to keep it, you know, it's difficult. That's the whole point of the hadith, but you have to hold on to it. All of us have to grasp this deen. Now what I want to do is give, uh, one at this point, just give the first slide. Now, if you look at this, um, this is by a man whose name is Robert Elgood. Now, he has identified in a book called The History and Future of Faith, he's identified five categories that take place in the history of religions. Now, I think this is an accurate identification, and this is part of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran, وَإِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْمُتَوَسِّمِينَ The person whose mutawassim is the one who thinks deeply, who scrutinizes, who looks into the sunan of creation. Now part of what he has pointed out is that there are these five uh, states. The first he calls the apostolic, which uh, uh, apostolic in Greek, apostol, is a rasul. So it's the time of the messenger himself and his immediate companions. Now if you look at this, the, the founder or founding exists, the first generations. This is what we call a salaf al-salih. These are the righteous people that are on the minhaj of the Prophet ﷺ. The next group is the imperial, which is what the Prophet called the muluk. So the Prophet said that it would go from the, uh, the uh, khilafa ala minhaj al nabuwa which we call the apostolic stage, and then it would go to the imperial, which is the mulukiya. And this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ articulated. This is what this professor at UCLA has identified. Now, what you see at the imperial level, that the, its wisdom dominates an imperial alliance. What that means is kings will use the religion as a way of uh, maintaining their power as a social cohesive force. And it will spread because of that. And so there's positive things to it and there's benefits. So if you look at the kings, Bani Umayyah, Bani Abbas, Wallahi, we wish we had one of their tyrants. 
We, uh, wallahi, I would give my right and left arm if we could have one of their tyrants ruling the Muslim land. Because they'd straighten things out. They would. The worst of them would do a better job than the best of the ones we have now. You know, it's like Muhammad al-Ghazali said, if one of these rulers now uh, w didn't have a job and they went with their qualifications to get a job as a, uh, a security guard, they wouldn't get it. I mean, they wouldn't get it. If they put their, gave their resume, right, Saddam Hussein, uh, primary occupation, killer. Um, <laughs> qualifications, a mass murderer, have killed uh, several thousands of human beings, you know, and you can check uh, families all over Iraq to confirm that and all over Iran, you know. So, I mean, that's what we're dealing with. Now, the next stage is the devotional. Now you can see this happen in the Muslim world. The Muslims went into a deeply spiritual period where really spirituality, and this was part of the reaction to the imperial dominance. You know, when, when dunya became so corrupted, a lot of these Muslims went into a deep internal state. Now, the Prophet ﷺ said that there would be dakhan, that hal min ba'di dharika shar khair, and he said na'am wa fihi dakhan. There would be, the, but there would be some dakhan in it. Um, all right. Now, the next uh, stage is the Reformation. Shifts to basics, outside forces challenge it. Now, if you look at the last stage, it's called folk religion, which means it's public authority slips, charismatics, traditionalists survive. If you look all, according to this man, Elgood, all of the world's religions are now in that last phase, which is the folk religion. They have no religion. It's just charismatics, like these preachers that go around on the television. They're, they're called charismatics. They have no brains, no intellect. They just stir people up. They're charismatic uh, speakers and orators, and they get people all stirred up, and that's, that's the they have no intellectual awareness, right? I mean, even uh, a man, Ahmadidat, who just recently had a stroke, and may Allah uh, give him a speedy recovery or take him with lutf, um, whatever Allah wills, uh, he uh, is a man who really is not by any traditional standards considered an alim. But he used to run rings around the, the, their uh, leaders. Why? Because he had knowledge of their book. They don't know their book. They're just charismatics. That's all they are. And you'll never see them. They quote the, from their, they've always got their book with them, right? We must tahfidhum in kitabillah. That's all they have. It's just, they, they don't have uh, the scholars that we have. Now, if you look, Buddhism has been in there for a long time. Chinese religion, and that was confirmed for me by a, a Buddhist scholar who said it's been centuries since there's been any true Buddhism. And then uh, Chinese religion, same thing. Hinduism, oh, Hinduism. <laughs> He, he got that one wrong. <laughs> That's been a folk religion for thousands of years. You know, but what he could leave him in Hafwa, I mean, he just, he got that one way off. He thinks they just went into their folklore. They've been drinking cow's urine for centuries. <laughs> if you don't think that's a folk religion, then I don't know what is. Right? And the poor women that suffer, they have to, in, in Hinduism, traditional classical Hinduism, they burn the widow alive when her husband dies. Because in their tradition, they don't believe a woman has any spiritual, what they call dharma. You know, she has no spiritual path other than service to her husband, and then she's a sati. She's like a widow. When he dies, she can't remarry. And unfortunately, according to Imam al-Kandahlawi, he said some of that jahiliya has affected the Muslims on the subcontinent. There's a lot of women that can't remarry. They go into what that, like a Hindu sati state. If the husband dies, she's expected, even she's a young woman, for the rest of her life to live without a husband. That's a horrific practice that should be eliminated from those Muslims. And that's what Imam al we said. It's a horrible thing to do to a woman. So then Christianity, again, they had their reformation with Luther and these type of things. Now they're in a folkloric stage. And it's finished. If you look at Islam, he says it's just now going in to the, refor the Reformation period. Just now. In other words, we're literally right at the verge of a return to Khilafah al Minhaj al Nabuwa. You see, we're right there. It's about to happen. So don't, don't despair. Just get... It's just going to take some time. You know, and, and alhamdulillah, al-faraj ma'as sabr, that the, 
the opening from Allah comes with patience. A sabr ala shada'id. The Prophet ﷺ was commanded, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ You have to be patient. The Prophet ﷺ was commanded to be patient. So what about us? And he was the most patient of the people who have patience. Now one thing I want to say about this religion, we are a religion of success. We are not a religion of failure. And we have to understand that. This is the deen of tawfiq and success. And there has never been failure in this ummah until just recently when people have this conquered mentality. We've entered into this conquered mentality where we think these people are somehow superior to us. They're not superior to us. We're being tried with them. Lina bluakum. That's why Allah is testing us. And one of the tests we have now is that these people have been put over us. Now part of that, if you look in there on the Reformation stage, Outside forces challenge them. So we're being challenged. And what we need to do is reform ourselves. Now, reformation in the Arabic language is called islah. And Imam Malik said, لا تصلح هذه آخر هذه الأمة إلا بما صلح به أولها the last portion of this ummah will not be rectified or reformed. That's what it means. The last of this ummah will not be reformed except by what reformed the beginning of the ummah. And that means going back to basics. That's what we have to do. Now there's another word in English which is going back to fundamentals. Which they love to banty about and call us fundamentalists. And they'll say, listen to that imam ranting and raving up there about the end of time. And those silly Muslims. Yes, haruna min al amanu. Tayyib, I don't care. Allah said they make fun of us. That's what Allah said. Wa marru bihim yatagamazun. When they pass by, they nudge and wink and laugh at them. That's what they do. Wa idha marru bihim yatagamazun. Wa idha qalabu ila ahli man qalabu fakihin. Wa idha ra'awhum qalu inna haula ila dalun. That's what they say about us. These people are just in obvious error. They're stupid people. The Prophet ﷺ, before the previous prophets, they say that only Aradilu Nas follow you, just the low people, the stupid people. Right? Now, the, the hadith that says, Akhtaru Ahl al Jannah al Bulh, that's not a sound hadith. That the majority of people in Jannah are stupid. Maybe from the perspective of other people. But majority of people in Jannah are Ulil al Bab, and that's who's in Jannah, the people with intelligence, not the stupid people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they weren't sent a hafidin over them. They're not our hufad. We're supposed to be muhaymin and alayhi. We're supposed to be the people that are over them. amanu. kafaru. We're supposed to be over them. La tahinu wa la tahzinu wa antum al-alawn. Al-Islam ya'lu wa la yu'la alayhi. Islam. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see this is the hikmah of the Prophet. He didn't say, al-Muslimun ya'lun wa la yu'laun alayhim. He said, Al-Islam, Ya'lu, wa la yu'la alay. So there's nothing over Islam. But Islam right now is hovering over the ummah. You see, we allowed it to be rufia. And this is what the hadith says. Yurfa. It's going to be raised up. We have to bring it back down. And the way we do that is through Islah. Now, I want to give, we've got just a few minutes. But uh, could you go to the next uh, slide there? In fact, no, go to, uh, go to the, the last one. I'll just forget those other two because I don't have much time. I think you need to... Uh, okay, good. You can get that all on there. All right. This, this is a model of what's happening here. What this book of Allah... You see, this book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down, it has a reality. And its reality is that Allah has created Subhan al-Ladi khalaq al-azwaja kullaha. Glory be to the one who's created everything in pairs. If you look, the end result of this book is two things. Either iman or kufr. That's the zawj of dunya. You're either mu'min or you're kafir. And there's no other person. Because munafiq is a, is a kafir as well. He's just internally a kafir, externally considered a Muslim. Now, the first thing that happens in this risala is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down a tanzil. Now this tanzil is deep. It's not a simple book. Because it's coming from Rabb al-Alameen. It's coming from the, the khaliq al-samawati wal ard It's coming literally from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not the sun al-bashar. A human being didn't invent this book. This book is not from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the conduit. He is the vehicle through which the book comes. And that is what he is. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Now, the, the tenzil comes. There are certain reactions. Here's what men of understanding and women of understanding do. They either, they ya'qilu, right? Afala ta'qilun. They use their intellect. They look at the book. Oh, from the Lord of the world. Let me see what it says. And they think about it. Afala ta'qilun. They yafhamun. They use their fahm, their understanding. You see, they're people of fahm. They're people of fiqh. لَهُمْ قُلُوبْ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا That's the kuffar. They don't have fiqh. And fiqh means deep understanding. The original faqih was the one that could tell which of the sheep was pregnant. In other words, it, had a, it looked to the inside. They had a deeper understanding. They were mutawassim. And then they يَتَفَكَّرُونَ الَّذِينَ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ they deeply reflect. Tafakkur is deep reflection. And tafakkur is for takalluf. It, in other words, it takes work to reflect. You see, that wasn't in the Arabic language. Tafa'ul usually means takalluf, mashaqqa. You have to think deeply. You can't be simplistic people. And then, yatadhakkaroon, because it's already something you know. It's a dhikra. It's a reminder of something we already know, which is our inherent fitrah, which is, Alas to be rabbikum, am I not your Lord? We all know that. And we witness to it. So tawheed is the dominant call of the book of Allah. It's to something we already know, but it takes tadakkur. You have to remember, oh, I remember that. I was in the presence of Allah, and He said, Alas to be rabbikum. And this is what we have to remind our children. And then tawassam, and you can go on, etc. You go on, yubsirun, they're people of uh, basira. Qul hadihi sabir yad'u ila Allah ala basira. I call to Allah with the inner sight. They're people of basair. Laqad ja'akum basairun min rabbikum. Faman absara fali nafsihi. Wa man amiya fa'alayha. These are internal proofs that take basira, inner penetrating vision and sight to perceive them, to understand them. So who the one who sees them, sees them for himself. وَمَنْ عَمِيَ فَعَلَيْهَا And the one who's blind is blind against his own self. Now, the organ of understanding is the lub and the qalb and the fu'ad. Because Allah جَعَلَ لَكُمْ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْأَفْئِدَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ he gave you this hearing, which is an, it's a, it's called mawarid al-ilm, the, the ability to hear. And he gave you the ability to see, which is another mawarid al-ilm. And he gave you fu'ad, the ability to process what you're experiencing, your information, your knowledge. It has to be processed by the fu'ad. Now there are, the meanings of the ayahs are two, and they're categorized as A and B. In the first one, it's, Ni'ma, rahma, etc. It's called tabshir. And this is what Ibn, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi in his beautiful introduction to the Qur'an in the Tasheel says that the Qur'an is two things basically. Tabshir wa indar. It gives warning and glad tidings. And usually the, the glad tidings precede the warning because it's targhib and tarheeb. So you can look at A as being targhib which is Allah enticing us telling us to come because there's benefit in this, or it's tarheeb, which is intiqam, iqab, adab, sakhat, indar. So you have tabshir, and the Prophet is what? Bashiran wa nadiran. He's a giver of good tidings and a warner. So this is, is basically what the Qur'an, the vast majority of ayahs can be reduced down to this understanding. If it's telling us about good things that happen, who people do good things, that's Bushra. If it warns us, it's Indar. There are two responses to these. Tasdiq or Takdeeb. You either believe it or you disbelieve it. If you believe it, you are called a Mu'man. Now you have to increase in Iman. Iman is something that tazidu bi ta'at. You see, it increases with ta'a. Wa tanqisu bil ma'asiyah. And it decreases with ma'asiyah. So this is what we have to be people of tasdiq. And then B is takdeeb are the mukaddibin, those who reject these signs. Now if you study the book of Allah, it will explain everything that's happening. It will tell you why people are in tribulation, including the Muslims. We will all find why things are happening, but the book needs understanding and depth and study and research to understand the sunnah of Allah. Now, the immediate consequence of tasdiq or takdeeb if it's tasdiq, 
then two things happen. Shukr, which is called ittiba' al-awamir. That is how you show gratitude to Allah. Gratitude is not saying, uh, Alhamdulillah wa shukru lillah. That's shukr ala lisan. But shukr has to penetrate the entire body. What comes from the lisan, inna ma ju'ila lisanu ala al-qalbi dalila. The, the, the heart, it has been given the tongue to interpret for it. So the shukr of the tongue should be coming from the heart. If there's a barrier between the tongue and the heart, in other words, if the tongue is saying one thing and the heart is believing another thing, that is called nifaq. You see, so if you're saying on your tongue, Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah, but your actions are takdeeb, your actions speak louder than your words. Your actions speak louder than your words. So if we're talking about all these things and we're not implementing them, in reality we are mukaddibin. We're not musaddiqeen. And then the other one is taqwa, which is ishtinab and nawahi, which is avoiding what Allah has prohibited. Now, the last number three, which is what we don't want to do, those are the people who have A and B equal plus the small b, which is takdeeb. So about ni'mah and intiqam, they don't believe it. They don't believe in the rewards Allah promises, and they don't have fear of the punishment that Allah warns us about. And so those people are in kufr. And then, so the mu'min is up there, and the kafir is down there. And then the final result is iman and kufr. And ultimately... For the mu'min, it means haya tayyibah in this life and in the next life. And for the kafir, it means shaqawa in this life and in the next life. And this is it. That's it. So, uh, can, I, can, I, can we pray and then finish? Because I, I can close it up and I want to get to questions and things. Can we do that? Is that all right? I mean, I have, maybe you had enough. People are passing out here. Uh, <laughs> All right, so I, I guess, we, inshallah, it's time for the prayer. Is it time? Ha, oh, c- ten minutes. Can, oh, all right. Then let, let, me, let me just finish what I want to say, and then we'll do the, uh, the, uh, the prayer. I'll break in a few minutes so people can go do wudu. And then when I come back, it'll be just questions and answers. Um, I want to look at a schema... And I wish I had an overhead for it. I'm done with those. Uh, but this is a schema that was given to us by the great uh, Moroccan scholar Ahmed Zarruq, who um, lived and died uh, in Libya, and he's buried in Misrata. And he was called Muhtasib al Ulama wal Awliya, which is the quality uh, control. Uh, person of the ulama and the awliya because he's a reformer of a lot of the innovations that entered into tasawwuf in the North African part of, uh, of uh, the continent. But he's one of the great uh, uh, Maliki jurisprudence. He has commentaries on al-Bukhari and Muslim and he also uh, has several uh, books. And one of them is a commentary on the hadith about nasiha which is called al-nasihat al-kafiyah liman khasuhu Allah bil uh, which means sufficient advice for the one who Allah has given al-afia. And basically what the scheme is, is that the hadith says, adinu nasiha. The deen is sound advice and it's also sincerity because nasiha means both sincerity and advice. And then it says, lillahi wa li rasulihi wa li kitabihi wa li ammatil muslimin wa khasatihim in the riwayah by Imam Muslim. Now the nasiha to Allah, what, what we need to do as Muslims is implement this schema. Alright, so... I'm going to go through it very quickly, but we really, all of us need to take it to heart and have a commitment to this in, in our time, inshallah, because this is how we will be reformed as an ummah. The, the nasiha to Allah has three important uh, qualities. The first one is ittiba' awamirihi, which means to follow those things that Allah has commanded to, for us to follow. At the most primary level, it's the arkan. That we have to pray, we have to renew our shahada. Jaddidu imanakum bi qawrikum la ilaha illallah. We have to uh, give our zakat, we have to fast, we have to make the hajj. We have to become people of the arkan, really. And we have to spread these arkan and revive the arkan in this ummah. And not just routinize. We need to bring life to these things, which means uh, serious uh, depth and understanding. And then the next one is nusratu uh, dinihi 
We have to give victory to this deen. We have to commit our lives to Allah's deen. Don't be foolish people waiting for the last hour or their death to come upon them and you're in a state of heedlessness. Be people of depth and sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to commit to the deen of Allah. And this involves uh, three things. Commitment to the deen which is nusra li deenihi. Al-jihad is the first one. We have to be people of jihad. And jihad is of... Uh, there's basically three types of jihad, which is jihad is safe, which means the martial jihad, which fighting the enemies of Islam who are uh, either attacking the uh, lands of Islam or under the khilafa, we do preemptive strikes, which is to prevent uh, any danger uh, of the uh, Muslim borders. And so that is al-jihad. And there is a hadith, the Prophet said, لا يزال الجihad حلوا خضرا Ma qatara sama. The jihad will remain a good thing as long as rain comes from the sky. Hatta yaqulu qurra'u ummati. Laysa hadha bi zaman al jihad. This isn't the time for jihad anymore. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ina daraktumuhu. If you reach that time, he said, Ni'ma zaman al jihad. That's the best time for jihad. When people are saying, no, there's no more jihad, that's the best time for jihad. And this ummah is an ummah of jihad and struggle. That is, some of them originally made it a sixth pillar of Islam. I mean, this deen is literally a deen of struggle. It means struggling fi sabilillah. Wa subhanallah, like Imam Malik said about jihad fi sabilillah, subhanallah kathira. His ways are many, there are many ways. وَالَّذِينَ جَهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا Those who struggle with us, Allah will guide them to the subul. How to struggle? In other words, if you start the struggle, Allah will inspire you and show you how to continue the struggle and the best ways to expend your life. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah is with the people of Ihsan, the people that are trying to do something out of their love for this deen, trying to beautify their world, because Ihsan means to make beautiful. And this deen is jameel. وَاللَّهُ جَمِيلٌ يُحِبُّ الْجَمَالِ Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. And the ihsan, the muhsin is the one who brings beauty about. And so there has to be... And then Amr bin Ma'roof. We have to command to good. Al Amr bin Ma'roof. And then Al Qiyam bi Asbabi Baqa'ihi. We have to do things that preserve the deen. Which means we have to be people of study. We have to be people that preserve this deen, the sciences of the deen. We have to be people of Ihya Ulum al Deen. The people who literally rev revivify the deen and the sciences of the deen. And we have to be those people. If we're not those people, then Allah will change us. If you turn away, Allah replaces you with other people. Allah doesn't need us. We need Allah. And then the, la the last one from these things, so you have ittiba' awamirihi, nusratu dinihi, and then attaslimu li amrihi. We have to submit to Allah's command, His affair. And there's two types, ta'ridi wa taklifi. Ta'ridi is those things that happen we have no control over. We have to surrender and submit to that. Allah will do things to us we have no control over, and we have to submit to that matter. And then the taklifi are those things we have control over. Those things that we brought upon ourselves. Those things that uh, we're, we're, we were, Allah told us not to do them and we did those. And those things, there are four things that there are necessary. The first is tawbah. And tawbah has three primary uh, concerns. Radd al which is to return those things that you have taken from people, harm them. If you stole money, you give the money back. If you made riba, you go and ask them forgiveness. Those type of things. Ishtinab al maharim which it means that you have to avoid what Allah has made prohibited. So tawbah, part of tawbah is not going back to the haram. And then the, uh, the last one is niyyah ala adam al-awda, that you never intend to go back to that thing. So part of tawbah is that you don't return to that thing that Allah has prohibited. And, and then the next three, so tawbah. And then the next three is sabr. You have to have sabr. And then you have to have shukr. And you have to have shuhud al-minna. You have to see the bounties of Allah, even in our tribulations, because there's bounties in it. If you look at Lebanon, those people that, that were uh, killed by those people, they're shuhada. Wallahi, our dead are shuhada. Their dead are finnar. So even in the tribulation, we have to recognize, no, it's a purification for this ummah. The Prophet ﷺ said, جُعِلَ عَذَابُ أُمَّتِي جُعِلَ عَذَابُ أُمَّتِي جُعِلَتْ اللَّهُمَّ صَلِيَ عَلَى سَيْنُ مُحَمَّدٍ
جعل عذاب أمتي في آخرها The last portion of my ummah would have much uh, punishment. Why? Because tahara wa kafara. We didn't purify ourselves with fasting and getting up in the night and praying and things. So we have to get purified by other ways. Because we're people of tahara and kafara. So our tribulations are tahara and kafara. Nothing afflicts this ummah except you get a reward for it. So we have to see even in our tribulation, there's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in our tribulation. And we have to witness that and, and be people of hamd and shukr. And so that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the following the commands, giving victory to the deen and submitting to Allah's amr. The next is to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this involves first, ittiba'u sunnatihi. We have to follow his sunnah. We have to be people of sunnah. We have to be people that begin to really take upon ourselves to, to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. And not lip service. I'm talking about following the sunnah. And, and this is not sunnah al-adat, which is a good thing. And we shouldn't belittle sunnah al-adat. Uh, but we should follow the sunnah al-ibadat. We should follow those things that the Prophet gave us to purify us. You see, really. I mean, the sunnah al-adat, like how the Prophet dressed, um, those type of things which are part of his jabillah, because he was an Arabian Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so he has a certain Arabic uh, character to his nature. That is not considered by the people of usul as, as something that is incumbent on people to follow. No, it's something that if you want to follow that, there's istihbab according to some of the ulama. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu liked to follow every single small detail of the sunnah of the Prophet. And that's a good thing to do. But we should be concerned with awliyat. With, with, with the primary and most important thing. There's people, wallahi, they're so concerned about the length of the beard or the length of the robe. One of the ulama 200 years ago, somebody told him about his beard being short and his robe being long. He said, listen, why don't you lengthen your uh, robe a little bit and shorten your beard a little bit and have uh, short ghafla and long dhikr? have a lot of uh, little bit of forgetfulness and a lot of remembrance. Make your prayer long and make your ma'asiyah short. You see, but people now, it's everything's put upside down. You really, we have our priorities completely crazy. And one of the signs of the, the, the sickness in people, halak and mutanatti'oon, the people who become obsessed with detail, they're destroyed. لَنْ يَشَدَّدِينَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا غَلَبَا and this is the sickness of the Jewish uh, tradition in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah. They become obsessed with every little detail, which is in no way denigrating or detracting the importance of the deen or of the fine details of Sharia. But if you become obsessed with that and lose sight of the big picture, and this is why, and take this into consideration people, think about this. Al-Qudai relates a tradition from Sayyidina Ali in which he said, Kadru jama'a khayru min safwal firqa. The polluted group is better than the pure sect. So if you want to separate yourself from the vast majority of Muslims and be this pure person that rejects everybody, that is worse than being with the jama'ah because we're strong in strength and numbers. And so we have to begin to have shafaqah. And that's part of this thing of having mercy for the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ and quit la tudayyq al This is the disease of small narrow-minded people is constricting the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's not your ummah, and you don't have any authority to throw people out of the ummah just because you don't like them. This is the Prophet's ummah. This is ummah al Muhammadiyah. It's not the the ummah of Abdullah or of Zainab or Khadija or Abdurrahman or anybody. It's the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the people that say shahada, they are the people of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is their shafi'. He is the one that will intercede for them. So don't be so quick to chase your brothers and sisters out of Islam. Because Islam is a broad gate, and it brings a lot of people in it. And there's people that find all the hadith that suit them to constrict the deen. They say, اَفْتَرَقَتَ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَ عَلَى ثَلَاثُ عَلَى وَاحِدُ وَالسَّبْعِينَ فِرْقَةً وَالنَّصَارَ عَلَى اثْنَيْنَ وَالسَّبْعِينَ فِرْقَةً وَسَتَفْتَرِقُ أُمَّتِي عَلَى ثَلَاثُ وَالسَّبْعِينَ كُلُّهُمْ فِي النَّارِ إِلَّا وَاحِدًا And they're always that one. The people that quote that hadith, they're always the one in there. You see, I mean, I find that fascinating because according to Abu Bakr, he was worried about being from the people of Naab. And his iman, according to the hadith, if everybody was put in one kafa and Abu Bakr's in another, the iman, نُزِعَ مَنَ الدَّعَ رُتْبَةً لَيْسَتْ لَهُ فُضِحَ بِشَوَاهِدٍ امْتِحَانٍ The one who claims to have a maqam, a station, a rank, 
that isn't his. Allah will expose him before the creation to show him for what he is, a Dajjal, an imposter. وَمَنَ الدَّعَ رُتْبَةً هِيَ لَهُ نُزِعَ مِنْهَا And the one who claims to have a rank that is his own rank, his rank is taken away from him. In other words, if you're really a, a salih, and you say, I'm a salih, Allah will take that islah away from you. Because it's not tawadr. And that's why Imam Ali, when they asked him, he said, مَا أَنَا إِلَّا رَجُلٌ مِّنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ I'm just a man from amongst the Muslims. That's Sayyidina Ali. This is humility. These people were humble people. They weren't arrogant people prancing around thinking that they were the best of creation. And they were the best of creation by the shahad of Allah. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ And yet they were people of humility before Allah and before the creation of Allah. And this is why al Ma'ziri. Uh, عنه, they said his knowledge was so vast, he rarely saw a munkar amongst the Muslims because he always used to find some excuse for them. In the deep knowledge that he had, he would find some weak opinion that gave a makhraj for his brothers and sisters. And now people look for the quickest thing, the harshest thing to condemn. So uh, I've been told it's prayer, and alhamdulillah, salatu khayru min kalam wa min kul shay. So uh, we'll pray and then. Uh, come back and I'll try to... Uh... Zaheer will deal with all of that. I can't... You know, I'm with him. So if you live with him, it's amazing. Sounds good. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, I, in شاء الله I'm going to try to get through these these questions, but uh, before before I do that, I would like to quickly go through uh, the, the the other things about the nasiha. Which the first was nasiha to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And that involved following his commands Giving victory to his deen And then submitting to his, uh, his amr The next was nasiha to the, to the messenger Which involved following his sunnah And then ikramu qarabatihi Which is showing ikram to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, family And we know the famous hadith uh, The athar of uh, Zayd and Ibn Abbas When Zayd took the camel, the zimam, a naqa, and he was carrying it, and uh, Zayd said to Ibn Abbas, you know, don't, I can, I'll take my own camel, and Ibn Abbas anhu said, كَذَارِكَ أُمِرْنَا أَنْ نَفَعَرَ بِعُلَمَائِنَا We were commanded to honor our scholars, and then uh, Zayd took the hand of Ibn Abbas and kissed his hand, and he said, كَذَارِكَ أُمِرْنَا like that, we were commanded to honor the family of the Prophet ﷺ. People are believed in their nasab. Uh, so people who are members of the family of the Prophet ﷺ, we should uh, honor them uh, for that reason. And the next is a shafaqa ala ummatihi, which is having compassion for the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. That it's really important to have compassion for the Prophet Sallallahu Ummah. And this basically uh, means that the conditions that we find the Muslims in, we have to really have shafaqa. And uh, to one of the examples of having shafaqa is really making allowances uh, for the shortcomings 
of our brothers and sisters to the best of our ability and patience. And the Prophet ﷺ was the best of those. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Mu'minat, Al-Mu'minuna wal Mu'minat, Ba'dhum awliya'u ba'd. The believers, men and women, are awliya of one another, protecting friends of each other. Ya'muruna bil ma'roof, wa yanhawna an al-munkar. They command to what is right and they prohibit what's evil. Wa yuqimuna salah. And they establish prayer. وَيَأْتُونَ زَكَاءً And they give out their zakah. وَيُطِيعُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And they obey Allah and His Messenger. أُولَٰئِكَ سَيَرْحَمُهُمَ اللَّهِ Those are the ones Allah will show His rahmah, His mercy to. And so having mercy to the people of the, of the ummah of this uh, Prophet ﷺ. And part of the showing mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows mercy to them. Why? اِرْحَمْ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ if you show mercy to the people on earth, the people, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show mercy to you. And so we should have mercy and compassion and really uh, lower the gaze to the faults of our brothers and sisters. And those things that need tambih, then you should give tambih in the best way. Adinu nasiha, which means deen is sincerity, but you have to give counsel out of love and not out of anger or wrath or hate. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he gave nasiha to his uh, people, he gave it in the best way. And he didn't, lem yu'ayyib ahad. He didn't use to uh, fault people in front of other people. He used to tell people in the best way, wal labiwud isharati yafham. And then the next is to his book, which means tadabburu ayatihi. We have to deeply reflect on the ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then uh, ittiba' ma'muratihi, which is also following what it uh, commands and, and avoiding what it prohibits. And that's part of nasiha to the book of Allah. And the final one is tahsinu tilawatihi, which is learning how to recite the book properly. That that's part of a nasiha lil kitab. And tajweed, alhamdulillah, of all the Islamic sciences, it is the, probably the easiest to learn. It's not a difficult thing. You can learn the ahkam of tajweed in a short period of time. And you might have lekna in your tongue, some difficulty, but still you should have the basic understanding uh, of the... Uh, and then nasiha to the majority of Muslims, part of that already in following the Prophet is shafaqah for his ummah. But one of it is adhabu an a'radihim, which is defending the good honor and name of the Muslims. That we have to be people that defend the honor and the name of the Muslims. And then the other is iqamatu hurmatihim. We have to establish their dignity and their sanctity. That Muslims are sanctified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have hurma. And part of that hurma is that our women should not be subjected to uh, oppression and tyranny. We have to defend our women. And wallahi, uh, we all, the men, all of us should weep over our, uh, our inability uh, in this age to be doing our duty to the women of Islam. Wallahi, I mean, uh, what happened in uh, Bosnia is a shame and a blemish on this generation. And if there's an ummah that comes after us, wallahi, I think they'll look back on us with disgust in the same way that we look back on some of the previous uh, generations that betrayed this deen with disgust. And we all witnessed it before our eyes, but part of it is establishing the hurma. And, and even the name of a woman in dialectical Arabic is hurma. You know, that's one of the names of the woman that she's sanctified in Islam and her she should be protected and preserved. And then the the other one is Anusra Lahum that he they help, they give victory to those Muslims in need. So we have to give victory to our, our Muslim brothers and sisters when uh, we see them being attacked. And then li khasatihim it means a ta'a lil umara. Ya yuhaladina amanu atiu laha. وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولُ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ Obey Allah and obey the Messenger and وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ Those in authority over you. Traditionally for the first three centuries that was interpreted as the ulama and the umara uh, because obedience is always, first of all, the amir by the conditions of our deen should be an alim. And if he's not an alim, he should have ulama as his bitana. You can't have an ignorant person. لا يصرح الناس فوضى uh, I'm getting, it's <laughs> getting too tired here. Um,
And then the next is so ta'a lil ulama wal umara. That is in everything other than disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the Amir is disobedient to Allah, then we don't obey them. But khuruj ala al umara is a very problematic issue in Islam. Uh, what's happening in some of the Muslim countries where people are attacking uh, the governments, these are very uh, problematic situations by the Sharia. Because traditionally, although traditionally the, 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 the Muslims did not have people uh, like these people in their distance from the deen, but nonetheless, uh, traditionally the Muslims did not, particularly the Sunni Muslims, did not believe in khuruj ala al-umara, even if he was fasiq. And the ayah, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمْ رِكَافِرُونَ Even Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, Akrima, the great Mufassirin said, هَذَا كُفْرٌ لَا يُخْرِجُهُ مِنَ الْمِلَّةِ This is a type of kufr that doesn't put the people outside of the millah of the Prophet ﷺ. In other words, that uh, Muslim rulers in the past have not established the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they haven't been considered kuffar by uh, the, the ulama. So it's very problematic to make takfir. And if you read uh, in the ahkam of Quran by Ibn al-Arabi al-Qadhi Abu Bakr, one of the great tafsirs under qawlihi ta'ala, when he says, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتِرُوا فَأَصْرِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا If you read uh, his tafsir of that ayah, he gives uh, a very extensive interpretation about khuruj an al aimma uh, and it's a, it's a problematic issue. وَلِخَاسَتِهِمْ أَتَّصْدِيقْ لِلْعُلَمَاء Part of what we have to do is believe our ulama. And you shouldn't argue with ulama if, you're not, uh, if you don't have knowledge. You can debate with an alim if you are of a level in which there's a possibility. Because الَّذِينِ يُجَادِلُونَ فِي اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ There's people that argue about things they have no knowledge. And part of, uh, of debating is to have knowledge and understanding. And Raghab al-Isbahani says, الْجِدَالُ فِي حَقَ الْعُلَمَاءِ مَكْرُوهُ فَكَيْفَ بِالْعَوَامِ That argumentation is a type, it's detested even for the ulama. So what about the simple people? And I've seen uh, scholars of Islam attacked in, in audiences by people that have no knowledge. And that's absolute disrespect to the scholars. And, and there is a way at the time of the Prophet uh, Omar, we know the woman that got up in the audience uh, and when Omar was trying to limit the dowry and she quoted the ayah of Quran about the qintar. And she said, a qintar is a large amount of money. So why are you trying to change what Allah has given to the women? And Omar immediately said, Asabat al-mar'a wa akhta Omar. The woman's right and Omar's wrong. And that's a, that's a man who's not ashamed of being wrong. And that's the way we should be. So if somebody makes a clear statement that's wrong or something like that, and somebody knows the right uh, answer, then they, they can interject. There's nothing wrong with that. And people, I've been, uh, people have interjected in talks that I've given if I've made a mistake or something like that. Um, and alhamdulillah, generally I have had very good adab from the Muslims. I have no complaints uh, about uh, the Muslims, you know, alhamdulillah, it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I've rarely had any, uh, you know, just uh, bad manners. And I have bad manners myself. So we're all kulukum khata'un wa khayrul khata'in tawabun. All of you make mistakes and the best people that make mistakes are the ones that make tawbah. So we all have our uh, nafs and our susceptibilities to things. And that's part of just having rahmah for the, the, the people. And, and, I'm, and in no way do I consider myself alim. And not, that's not out of humility or anything. I, I, bari'un min tilka da'wa. I have no claim to that. Um, at, at best, I would uh, hope maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, raise me up with the, in the company of, of those righteous people, but I have no claim. I just uh, feel like I had the blessing of uh, being a tufayli, you know, like the guy that invites himself to the party, and I got to sit with some good scholars and things like that. But uh, an alim is a high maqam. And somebody asked me the question that you said that the ulama can be counted on the fingers, and if somebody knows the prayer, that aren't they considered an alim? And when I say alim, I mean by that 
a mustalah. It's a technical term for somebody who has an extremely advanced state of knowledge. And generally the ulama were people who mastered at least 18 sciences. Now, and I'm not exaggerating, in this day and age, if you get somebody who masters one of those, he's considered phenomenal. And that's not a joke. If you get somebody who's a master of uh, al arabiya in this age, it's something amazing. And, or usul, or hadith. And those ulama, if you look at them, they were masters of several uh, ulama al-hadith. They knew tafsir, they knew logha, they knew mantiq, they knew bayan, ma'ani, badi' they knew uh, usul. They knew all of these sciences that now it would take the average person several years just to uh, finish one. So really that's what I was talking about. Now anybody that knows something, he is alim of that thing. But he's not an alim in the, in the technical sense of the word. And a faqih is somebody who is less than an alim. And there are still some fuqaha. Um, but fuqaha are getting rare also. And a faqih is somebody who truly knows the ahkam of one of the madhab or all of the madhab or two or three. A faqih is somebody who understands the ahkam of Allah. If you ask him a question, he can give you uh, an opinion, a fatwa. And that's getting difficult also. There's not uh, very many people that really... Uh, you, I personally feel safe with their fatwa. I mean, alhamdulillah, I have a sheikh that I studied with from the Emirates who, who's from Mauritania and he is a mufti and I have access to him by telephone. I call him probably three times a month sometimes uh, just to ask him questions. Uh, but he's somebody that I trust. So, and that's a blessing to have access to, to those people. So, and then finally, a uh, tasrimu lil fuqara and what he means by that is those people, the ubad, uh, like Ahlul Sufa, the people that uh, dedicated their lives to uh, the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Rajab, uh, uh, Ibn Rajab al-Hambari, radiallahu anhu, he says, the ulama are three. A'alimun billahi wa a'alimun bi ahkami Allah, a'alimun bi ahkami Allah wa jahilun billah, wa a'alimun billah wa jahilun bi ahkami Allah. Those, that's the definition that he gives and he's one of our rightly guided imams of the ulama. The alim who knows Allah and he knows the rules that Allah has sent down. And that's, he said, يُفِيدُ نَفْسُهُ وَيُفِيدُ غَيْرَهُ He benefits himself and he benefits other people. And that's somebody who practices the knowledge that they know. And so the knowledge directly affects their hearts and they become people of taqwa. And then alim who knows the ahkam of Allah but doesn't know Allah. And that's an alim who knows the rules but has no taqwa. And those people, يُفِيدُ غَيْرُهُ وَيَضُرُّ نَفْسَهُ he benefits others, but he harms his own self. And the last one is called Alimun Billahi Wajahinu Biahkamida. It's somebody who knows Allah, he has taqwa, but his knowledge is just restricted to the Farda'in. He only knows what he needs to know for himself, but he's Abid, and Allah loves him. And those people, Alhamdulillah, they, they traditionally were very many in this Ummah. The one who knows is better over, is more fierce over Allah than a thousand uh, abid. So that is the basic uh, schema. Um, what, what would your advice be to someone who seriously wants to enter into study, Quranic studies, fiqh, sunnah, and other such subjects, if they are being pressured by parents to learn something quote unquote practical? The most practical thing you can learn in your life is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because all that other knowledge, uh, although it's a fard kifaya, the deen of Allah is fard ayn. If you've completed your fard ayn, which is not weekend Islam, fard ayn is actually ahkam al wudu are quite extensive. You, you need to know about najasa and what makes things najas. You need to know about shurut al wudu. If you take a poll of people coming out of Jummahs now and just ask them to give you the, the shurut al wudu, fara'id al wudu, on any of the imam's opinions, because some say, uh, uh, like Abu Hanifa has uh, some, uh, uh, Shafi'i has a number, Madik has a number. You just ask them, tell, tell them just the number. Don't even tell them to name them. And you'll find a lot of people don't even know. They don't di differentiate between sunnah and fard and wudu. So just learning basic Islam, wukunu rabbaniyin. The rabbaniyin are people that teach small things before they teach big things. And the sahaba knew, uh, you know, every, all of them knew fard ayn with rare exception of people that just became Muslim and died. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said people go to Jannah who know nothing. So really you have to learn that and your parents cannot prohibit you from learning that. In terms of going on and learning more, whether you go to engineering or any school or uh, any uh, 
uh, worldly things which are important, you should still be committed to study and increase in knowledge. That, you know, uh, uh, the ta'alum عندنا من المهدي إلى اللحد. Learning is from the cradle to the grave from the Muslims. And that's a sign that he knew also that children learn in the cradle because there's massive learning going on when children are in their graves. Uh, you mentioned, uh, oh, I already dealt with that. Um, Uh, I am uh, I am experiencing an extreme frustration trying to bond the different ethnically diverse Muslim families living in close proximity in my neighborhood. The parents are struggling te to teach their children their ethnic culture and language with the blessings of the Ministry of Multiculturalism, thus dividing their children as uh, well. You said yesterday we should honor our culture, but I fear that we end up paying the price uh, at, losing, uh, at losing our common co Islamic culture. Well, I would say I, I'm, I didn't really mean honor the culture. I, I meant that there's nothing wrong with culture that doesn't go against Islam. It's called the urf. And urf is actually one of the principles in usul. So the urf is looked at. It's the custom of a people. And you can see even in Maliki fiqh, the Tuareg who cover their, they veil, the men veil their faces. And uh, some of the Maliki ulama because of the urf, uh, because they actually consider the mouth naked in their custom, in their urf, for the men to expose their mouth. And the Maliki ulama honored that, uh, that custom amongst them. And they actually mentioned it in the rules for the people living uh, in that area and gave them specific fatwas and things like that. So the urf is something that Islam honors as long as it's... Uh, uh, consonant with the Islamic teaching itself. When the urf goes against the teaching, then Islam throws it out. And uh, in terms of teaching your children their culture, I mean, first of all, uh, if you're living in this culture, there, there's a whole other culture here. And to try to bring this whole back home in, there used to be a woman, Karima Omar, I don't know what happened to her, but she, she used to write some articles and they were about, uh, she called it the back home -ian mentality. And, uh, you know, how all people always say, well, back home we do it this way. Back home we do it this way. Um, it, well, back home looks pretty bad. So we have to wonder if doing it the way you did it back home is really all that good. Because uh, if back home was working, I don't think a lot of you would even be here in the first place. So uh, we have to really seriously think about what back home means. And, and you know, they say, حب الوطن من iman." Uh, people misinterpret that hadith, love of the nation, they translate it. Watan, if you read Imam Nawawi's interpretation of Watan, he said, uh, When they realize, when the Ubad realize that this dunya is not their Watan, حب الوطن من iman means حب jannah because that's the Watan of the Mu'min. You see, it's not the nation and things like that. I mean, we love Darul Islam, but we don't particularly love one over the other unless it's Al Ard Al Muqaddasa, Al Biqa' Al Mutahara, like Mecca, Medina, and Al Quds have a special place amongst us more than the other places. But we love all of Darul Islam, and so and Damascus is of the after the three. Damascus also has a special maqam, and so does Egypt because the Prophet. Uh, his family is from Egypt. Egypt, he told us to be good to the Egyptian people. That's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. You know, he said, be good to the Egyptian people. Um, because his uh, Hajar is from the Egyptians, and that's his descendant of that uh, tradition. And also, his uh, uh, maidservant, Mary al Qaptiya is Um Walad for the Prophet. She gave birth to Ibrahim, and so uh, Ibrahim, his son, and that's one of his kunyas, Abu Ibrahim, was also from the Egyptian, and so he honored, uh, uh, he told us to honor them for that. So those things, but all the Muslims, we should honor them. Uh, you know, that, that nasiha from the Prophet might, because some people might get impatient with Egyptians sometimes. <laughs> oh. Did somebody have a question up there? Go ahead. Alaikum <laughs> salam. When 
here wants it to be that way, but we have no single leader like they had back then. Sometimes I feel helpless. We have the Quran, everything laid out for us, but we can't be as strong as we should be. Is there anything we can personally do to help the Muslims on a local level to far- form a strong and good community? Because the prophets and his companions were a few people, but they influenced the whole world. So do you have any suggestions to help make a strong Muslim community here? Well, inshallah, that's what all this was about generally, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, a lot of what I was saying tonight was directed towards that very issue. So uh, maybe if you just reflect on uh, some of these different things, because hopefully that's what we're all trying to do. Um, would you like to know... Uh, I would like to know what the real hijab is. I don't answer hijab questions because every place I've ever been to, there's questions about this, and it's like, is riba halal or not? I mean, it just, I'm not making whoever's asking that. I know they put important on there, but subhanAllah. I just, uh, we gotta, we got to raise our level up. I'm sorry. I mean, come on, let's move on. Really, let's move on. You know, is can I take a mortgage on my house? Uh, are we terrorists? I mean, what? let's move on. <laughs> you know, whoever asked that question, I'm not making fun of you at all or anything. Really, questions are important, but I just, we got to move on. We got to really, we got to move on with things. Hijab is well known. There's no, uh, you know, and there's different, there's different places have different hijab, you know. You go to uh, Morocco and it was different from the Pakistani traditional, but all you have to do if you want to know what hijab looks like, look at a photograph of any Muslim woman a hundred years ago. Just get a picture book out that has pictures of Muslim countries and look at any woman photographed 100 years ago and that's traditionally how Muslims dressed. And they didn't have a problem with this question. You know, I mean, this is just part of the end of time scenario. So, okay. No, why? What do you want? What's the announcement? They're making comments and not questions. Oh, okay. No, that's okay. Just let it all come. Uh, uh, I see that you look healthy. MashaAllah, fatabarak Allah. And could you tell brothers and sisters how, do you, how to lead a healthy lifestyle? Please note that Muslims here in Toronto are highest rate of heart problems among ethnic groups. Well, I mean, I would say personally, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna li jasidika alayka haqqa. Your body has a right over you. Now, the amazing thing is, this is an age of miracles and wonders. And one of the fascinating things of this time is they have determined exactly what the haqq of your body is. Exactly what it is, down to the calories that you actually need to consume every day, right? And if you look at the amount of calories that you need to consume, you'll see that it's pretty much uh, coherent with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Most people eat about three times to four times more than they they actually need as fuel to burn uh, energy. And uh, I believe in eating as pure food as possible. I think Muslims should be semi-vegetarian because I think the Prophet ﷺ actually did not eat a lot of meat during the khilaf of Umar radiallahu anhu. He forbade meat to be eaten two days in a row. We know that uh, uh, that food was uh, brought from uh, from Persia that was sweet, um, and they used to the the. It's mentioned in many books, Alf Layla wa Layla, things like that. It was like baklava, and Umar said when he was given it, he said. Do all the Muslims eat this? And they said, no, only the rich eat it. And he said, Then I don't want to eat it until all the Muslims are eating it. And so really part of shafaqa to this ummah is, is recognizing there's a lot of our Muslim brothers and sisters that don't eat very well. And so we should be really thinking about the weight that we're gaining. It's bad for you, first of all, that any physician will tell you that. Uh, you don't need two cents worth of brains to realize that overeating is not a good thing. In fact, according to the National Institute of Health in America, 80% of American diseases are from overeating. And the other thing is exercise. The Prophet ﷺ exercised. We know that. He actually exercised. And he said that your body has a right. And they used to walk everywhere. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ had a flat stomach and he died with a flat stomach according to a hadith. And he didn't like fat stomachs. And he used to say to people, 
This thing that you're carrying around, this extra weight, would look a lot better on somebody else. In other words, that fat that you've got would look better on a skinny person that needs to gain some weight. And Omar, in the Muwatta of Imam Malik, there's two hadiths about meat. And both of them are warnings about meat. One of them says, إِيَّاكُمْ وَاللَّحَمْ فَإِنَّ لَهُ الدَّرَاوَةَ كَالدَّرَاوَةَ الْخَمَرَ Beware of meat because it has the addiction, like the addiction of wine. And I recommend for people to read two books if they really want to understand this stuff because it's totally coherent with the Sunnah. One of them is called Diet for a New America by John Robbins, which is an analysis of the meat industry and the wretched things that they do to animals because we are against the uh, mistreatment of animals. We have to have humane treatment of animals. Part of the ihsan of killing an animal is that you sharpen the knife, that you don't sharpen it in front of the animal, that you give the animal water before you actually sacrifice it, that you don't drag it to where you're going to sacrifice sacrifice it, you lead it gently, that you don't show it the knife until the last minute when you pull it out quickly. I mean, those are all part of our sunnah that you'll find in the books of fiqh. And now if you go look how they treat animals, it's wretched. And you're eating, that meat that you're eating has part of that reality invested in it. Really. Part of the torture that goes into all those animals, that's part of what people are eating. All that fear and that adrenaline that those animals release constantly into their flesh. That's part of what the people are eating. And that's why everybody's in this state of fear and anxiety. So people should think about that. And the other one, Omar said, Every time you get hungry, you go out and buy meat. And the man said, Naam, ya Amirul Mu'mineen. And he said, it would be better if you would uh, stop buying, eating so much meat and allow other brothers to eat. Now part of the thing, if you look at, it takes to make one pound of meat, it takes seven pounds of grain. And there's people starving all over the world. So part of this uh, beef-eating uh, Anglo-Saxon culture that's being spread all over the world, which is cow, beef, and McDonald's in every country. I mean, part of the end of time is McDonald's in Mecca. And that's not a joke. That's a horrific thing to realize that there is a McDonald's now in Mecca. The, most, the holiest place on earth and this sick and disgusting multinational corporation that feeds people pulp. Really gross, grotesque food that has no nutritional value at all. No nutritional value. You're be better off eating the cardboard that that stuff comes in. And, and that's true. That's true. It's the worst type meat they use. It's all meat for, filled with hormones. You know, people in Puerto Rico, they had all these women at the age of six years old developing huge breasts because they were using so much hormones in the meat, uh, the estrogen. To, to beef up the cattle. That's what they do. So people becoming homosexuals, well, maybe it's all that hormone meat they're eating, you know? <laughs> so, and then exercise. Muslims should exercise. Men and the women. They, people should be exercising. Now, women can be a little plump by the sunnah. I mean, there's, you know, you don't blame a woman for having plumpness, but it's unbecoming on a man to be plump. It really is. But, but the woman, you know, alhamdulillah, they have, they bury children and they bear children and things like that. So there's, there's a, they need some extra weight and, and the men shouldn't find fault in that. But the women also should be healthy and take care of themselves. And the women are more responsible about that because they generally tend to cook the food. Although it's good for the men to help them out too. Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He used to serve his family. He used to help them in the house. You know, and now a Muslim man cook a meal for a Muslim woman is be like the woman would pass out. She'd faint. <laughs> she, Subhanallah. It's like it's some kind of ar or something like that. You know, to, you know, aib ya khi, aib kiv, akhdem zosti, aib. Regarding question of marriage in civic court, my understanding is that arkanu uh, nikah are the following. Uh, that ijab, um, qabul, uh, ashuhud, what ishhar. That's true, but it's based on deen. You know, the point is that uh, nikah, these are the conditions, the shurut and nikah. But, you know, the, uh, the, the arkanu nikah, but part of the shurut is the deen as well. You know, I mean, something doesn't just have to have the, uh, the arkan to be fulfilled. There's also uh, the... Uh, why, so why would Islam not recognize uh, marriage in a court? Well, I, this is a new phenomenon. To be married outside of religion is a modern phenomenon, and I'm not giving a fatwa about it because I'm not a mufti. Uh, but traditionally, the, if you look, what I've seen in the books of fiqh is that it accepted the uh, marriages of the previous uh, deans when people became Muslim. Traditionally, there was no secular. They didn't have people that didn't have uh, a dean 
uh, I mean, even the mushrikeen had a deen. Lakum deenukum wali a deen. They had some ibadah and some things. And these people have become their absolute mulhidun. And uh, the courts are invested by the government, not by uh, Allah. But again, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i take that back, recant everything I said about that. And you just, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرًا كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Because I'm not from those people. I have a question based on the theory that one should practice what he preached. What I understand is the correct way to, uh, to groom one's face hair as a full beard with light and mustache. Is this correct? If so, why do you only wear a goatee? Well, this is an example of su'adhan. Uh, Bin Muslimin. Uh, first of all, uh, I have no hair on my what's called the liha. All right, and I shouldn't even have to defend myself about this, but this is the type of thing people just automatically assume, you know, things. So I don't have hair growth on my liha. I don't have any hair. Uh, this is the way Allah created me. I'm sorry if it bothers you. I wish I had a full beard. Uh, but that, that's the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, created me. So. I mean, what the person's implying here is that I'm not practicing what I preach. You know, I mean, I have a question about the theory one should practice what he preached, uh, the correct rate of groom, so why do you only have a goatee? Uh, mashallah, everybody's at a certain level of understanding. Uh, if that's your level, even the goat has a goatee, like, like I said yesterday. And I've seen a lot of people with beards. Jews have very long beards, you know. Uh, okay. Let me... Take one last question. Mm. You advise us to educate the children, but the schools here contaminate our children. So what do you advise us about children going to these schools? Uh, I would advise you to take them out of those schools. Um, that's my personal advice. Um, I would never put my child in a non-Muslim school. And uh, there's a... Uh, a beautiful book called Al Madkhal li Ibn Al Hajj, and in the Madkhal he has a, uh, a whole chapter called Nahyu an Ba'ath Awlad al Muslimin ila Madaris al Nasara. He wrote it in the 6th century. It's called the Prohibition, and he considered it Nahyu Tahrim, that it was haram to send Muslim children to Christian, uh, to Christian people to teach them anything. And he brings also mentions that some of the Muslims say that what about, uh, things that Muslims don't have knowledge of and didn't the Prophet Sallallahu have the mushrikeen uh, teach the Muslims how to read. First of all, those weren't Muslim children those mushrikeen were teaching. They were adults. And it is permissible for an adult to go to a non-Muslim to learn a science that the Muslims need. So if the Muslims don't know uh, physics or something like that, or the kafir has superior knowledge of medicine uh, and those type of things, then yes, the Muslims need to go and get that knowledge because that hikmatu dalat al mu'min, but not the children. And there's, I've never seen uh, any child that can grasp high energy physics or uh, medicine or things the Muslims might need, right? I mean, children need just to learn basic things that, alhamdulillah, we have more than enough people that can teach those things, but we have to start giving infaq, spending out money, and creating madaris. And if it means sacrificing, it means sacrificing. And if there's not sacrifice, they say, الدِّينُ بِدَا إِنْفَاقْ نِفَاقْ A deen without infaq, spending money, is nifaq. It's just hypocrisy. So we're just a bunch of hypocrites if there's no uh, spending. And our children, wallahi, they'll curse us. They'll curse us. That's what they'll do. Either in kufr or in iman because we didn't take care of their needs. Right? And I know a lot of Muslims that are just, they, they really regret the fact that their parents didn't teach them deen. And now they're like 18 or 19 and having to learn things they should have learned when they were 6 and 7. Seriously. A great, gross neglect. And just one thing one sister just mentioned to me about, uh, 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 you know, that I mentioned women should stay in the house and things like that. Uh, women, had, traditionally in the Muslim world, they did work. Um, there's no prohibition of women working outside of the home in Islam as far as I know. The uh, Khadija radiallahu was a merchant. She was a very wealthy woman. Had she not had that money, she couldn't have uh, supported the Prophet sallallahu as well as she did. The Prophet was asked in a sound hadith um, about um, the Prophet, um, a woman asked the Prophet sallallahu you know, Allah made the men qawameen wa bima anfaqu because of what, how they support the women and they get that reward. And she said, what about a woman who supports her husband? And he said, laha ajaran. She has two rewards. 
the reward of infaq, of supporting him, and the reward of tatawwa, of doing it voluntarily because she doesn't have to do it. It's not an obligation on her. Now, there were many women who had great wealth in, in the history of Islam. So there's nothing wrong with women uh, going out and working. Now, at, if it's at the cost of the children, this is where I personally believe that there's a gross problem because our children are worth more than anything in the dunya other than our iman. Wallahi, my children, I value them over and above everything other than my deen. I, my children, I put them over and above everything other than my deen. And I will sacrifice a nafsi wa nafis for my children. Wallahi, and I'm not just saying that. I'll, I would sacrifice for my children for their needs. And that's just, that's personally how I feel. And I think part of the tragedy of this age we're living in is the gross abuse of the children. And these children come back with a vengeance. And they, they wreak revenge on our societies. And there's angry children everywhere. And one of the signs of the end of time, the Prophet ﷺ said, سَيَكُونَ الْمَطْرُ قَيْذَ وَالْوَرَدُ غَيْذَ The rain would be acidic. That's what qaid means. It means burning. Rain would be acidic. And he said, and children would be filled with rage. And the rage comes because they did not get the milk of human kindness. And women, for at least the first five years, you have to dedicate those to your children. At least the first five years. Preferably the first seven years. After seven, then things change. But those first formulating years are, and at the bare minimum, the first two years. That's trust versus mistrust. They have to feel that love of the mother. When they cry, it has to be the response of the mother. If your grandmother can take care of the child, that is a good thing. The child, the mother is not the only source of love. And in traditional societies that are tribal by nature, it wasn't just the mother that raised the child, but it was also the greater family. So the aunts and the, I mean, there are ways. But to put a child into one of these daycare centers, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Wallahi, I think it's criminal. It's a criminal act. I really believe that. And, and, and if you disagree with me, alhamdulillah, everybody, uh, everything that I've said, uh, I don't, you, you, you have a mind of your own. Take what you see as useful. What a beautiful qa'idah the Quran has given us. Those who listen to words and they follow the best of it. So whatever I've said, follow the best of it. If it's, uh, there's things that I've said that are wrong or something like that, I'm a human being. I don't have all the answers. I don't even have very many of them, but inshallah maybe I have a few. And, uh, what the benefit, what few that I might have are just from the blessing of the shiuch that I studied with and enlightened me and jazamallahu khairan. You know, but alhamdulillah, we're all human, we're struggling. We're all, all of you are my brothers and sisters. We're working inshallah for the same goal, to raise the level of this deen, to, not to raise the deen, to raise ourselves up to the level of the deen and to establish this deen and to be people of, of islah. Not of false claims, but of people that want to be لا أريد إلا إصلاحا. I only want إصلاح. That's what we want: is is to be people of uh, of إصلاح, not of false claims. Not الذين إذا قيل لهم لا تفسدوا في الأرض قالوا إنما نحن مصلحون. Not the people of false claims who say we're the rectifiers. No, the people that want to be من المصلحين want to be from amongst them. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ورسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه غفور رحيم. اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين واقطع دابر الكافرين اللهم فهمنا فهم النبيين واجعل لنا صدق صدق الصديقين وشهادة الشهداء وصلاح الصالحين اللهم بارك في هذه الجماعة وانزر علينا رحمة من عندك إنك أنت أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم إنك أنت الوهاب فهب لنا من لدنك رحمة اللهم عز الإسلام وانصر المسلمين والمجاهدين في كل مكان واحد بين صفوفنا وألف بين قلوبنا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم بارك في نسائنا اللهم اجعلهن الصالحات طائعات عابدات قانتات اللهم اجعلهن مربيات اللهم بارك في رجالنا اللهم اجعلهم مجاهدين اللهم اجعلهم من المجاهدين اللهم اجعلهم من الذين ينصرون هذا الدين اللهم بعدنا عن الفساق والفسق والمعصية وكل شيء لا يرضيك يا رحم الراحمين اللهم إنك قل قد وقول قل حق إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على أفضل خلق الله وجزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته